Happy 19th of November. Happy 20th anniversary to Half-Life. Happy celebrations to the seminal game that inspired every game beyond it in at least one way. <sighs> wow, the 19th of November was a pretty jam-packed day for epic gamers like us. We got the release of Artifacts. Haha. <laughs> oh, well, at least Valve did something magical to commemorate their flagship game. Ah. <sighs> Fuck it, let's talk about 720. So first things first, I think you can all understand that the only way to play Rubik might be delayed a little bit, you know? I mean, one of these days I'm gonna have enough time in between major Dota updates for my other life ambitions. One of these days. I mean, sooner or later I'll be able to start that Neo post rock where I play drummers with a gang of other astronauts. We'd call it space rock, but turns out that's already a thing. But yet again, that's a dream for a future Eric. This Eric has about a billion 18 hour days ahead of him to try and churn out, honestly, probably around like two hours of only way to play episodes in store for him as he tries to make sense of the absolute mind mind-bending chaos that is Dota 720. I just realized that I said happy 19th of November because at this exact point it is the 19th of November. But obviously by the time that you're going to watch this it's not going to be the 19th of November. It would be lucky if it was still November just in general. But uh, I honestly have no idea where to start. I, I mean I, I have no idea how long this is this breakdown is going to be. I, I, I have no idea if I'm still going to be the same person by the end of it. I, but I guess it's just like ripping off a band-aid so let's not stall. Oh cool, the map's been reworked. Uh, well that's one section done, moving on. No, okay, okay, kidding. Valve had the luxury of summing it up in four words like they're channeling Ember Spirit, but we are the only way to play studio. So, so me. I have the responsibility to show you the ramifications of those four words in that order. The map has been reworked. For the sake of brevity, or to be more specific, for the sake of the race to get this video out before the eventual heat death of the universe, I'll skim and talk broadly about the major parts of the map rework. The first thing that immediately springs up is the fact that an entire layer of elevation has pretty much just been removed in all but the jungle spots around shrines which is actually kind of awesome. I've never really been a fan of a game that deliberately brings in an element of frustration or stress as a game mechanic or at least as a feature but for I think all of the years that I've ever played Dota taking high ground has been a painful and arduous and all up not fun part of the game. It was tedious. You already had to fight uphill with the usual lack of vision and with the defending team having 180 degrees with you know which to target you from but to make it all worse you were pushed into this choke point of low ground because it was a high ground and then you went down the steps to get back up the steps. You know like the entire way except for mid. Back before 720 every side lane Radiant and Dyer had a trough between the tier 2 tower but before high ground and at least a concerted effort was made to grit your teeth and endure being funneled into that choke point of stress and frustration you just wouldn't be able to take high ground. It's not fun fighting into sniper shrapnel or tinker march of the machines but at least with 720 it's not as frustrating it's only a quality of life fix and any change that makes the game more fun for all is a good change with that said because of a lack of elevation on those sidelines at all the couple of jungle camps that are elevated are now probably the safest neighborhood to build a house and raise kids good school district just don't let them fraternize with those dirty kobolds i truly don't have any idea where you'd want to be putting wards nowadays but i can imagine that there's probably no need to put them in the jungle defensively as with the high ground advantage that you now have you can already see any gang attempts on you long before they're aware that you're there honestly i've never really been the best when it comes to warding so uh put them in range of the river runes like our ancestors have always done and leave well enough alone hey eh? speaking of river runes though uh there's a new one and i wonder what you guys have to say about it because i think it might be quite different to my thoughts to get everyone in the loop, the Diet Top Bounty Rune has been shifted dramatically and actually placed on the river at the base of two staircases that take you up to the elevation of the entire Dire Top Lane. This is clearly a major buff to Radiant, right? I mean, they they already held an at least 7% higher win rate than their Dire counterparts. I mean, clearly, they now have vision of the rune from miles away, from their Radiant staircase away. There's absolutely no threat involved in checking if the Bounty Rune is there or not. But that's not what Bounty Runes are for. You gain no gold from simply observing its presence. You have to pick it up. And that, right there, is why it's a Dire buff. Now, I know what you're saying, but Eric, it was already good for Dire and bad for Radiant where it was, on the high ground. Dire already had vision to see if it was there or not, and Radiant had to go out of their way to try and walk up next to it to get vision of it to see if it was there. And yes, on that I would absolutely agree, but there is a fascinating psychological phenomenon that you can experience when you can literally see the reward. The confirmation that it exists is enough to make your mind go, oh, it hasn't been taken, therefore it won't be taken. No Dire are nearby, because if they were nearby, they would have already taken it. It's irrational now with me speaking it and it's irrational to think in game also but just try and tell me that you don't think the exact same thing 
every time you see that untouched bounty rune there. This is why it's good for Dyer. You can also for some reason ward in these pits which is extremely beneficial for reconnaissance. And what I actually mean by that is uh, that it's needlessly causing future arguments for right after a support misclicks and puts one right in there. Because why would these pits have warding capabilities? No other pits have ever had that. On the flip side though, because that pit has warding capabilities, this giant rock and a pretty awesome thoroughfare also has the ability to be rewarded. You gotta take the good with the bad. I mean, until both are patched out completely. And of course, it wouldn't be an only way to play map analysis without us jumping into the hammer map editor and flying around. Oh, would you look at how stubby these creep camp bounding boxes are. You know what that means. It's just a shame, really. As much as these map changes are awesome, they're Dota. It's not a Half-Life thing. It's still not a Half-Life thing. 20 years on, and that game is still being admired, and that's nothing to scoff at. It's amazing. I hope that when I turn 20 in a few years, I would be able to look back at the things I've inspired like Half-Life can. But Valve gave nary a peep about it. All we got were these measly map changes. whoop de doo Slightly raised plateaus. No anniversary acknowledgement. No special event. No AR j Wait a second. Half-Life took place in the Black Mesa Research Facility. Mesa? A mesa is a flat-topped hill with steep sides. Oh my god, it's happening! Let's look for more clues. Oh god, that was one bullet point. Okay, okay, let's speed it up with, uh, uh, um, oh, uh, deniers no longer give the deny a portion of the XP, but they do now give him gold. Can you say Shadowfeed and Bloodseeker Renaissance? Heroes who already benefit from denying as much as possible anyway. I mean, you can just look at Dota buff to see all heroes with the highest deny rate. Shadowfiend, Templar Assassin, Morphling, and no, I know what you're thinking, but I already tried it. Clockworks, Cogs, don't give Clockwork free gold, as much as they totally should, right? I mean, just having the ability to just spawn creeps that give you gold. TP scrolls no longer take up a whole item slot, which is kind of sad, uh, kind of good. I don't really know. It's easier to, you know, play as a whole, but there was always some finesse in the decision between having a TP scroll in your sixth item slot versus splurging and getting that new item. But then again, to be fair, this was probably, you know, ruined as soon as backpacks came along. Now, instead of it, you know, being finesse and an actual decision that you have to make, it's just assumed that you'll always have a TP scroll. The TP scroll is always going to be in your inventory. You're never going to be nine slotted so much that you can't fit a TP scroll. So I guess at that point, yeah, I'll agree. A TP scroll being in the backpack and then moving it into the six item slot was just tedious because you had to wait for six seconds and I mean yeah you know honestly this is a buff to any late game hero who prefers other types of boots that aren't boots of travels like anyone who buys greaves but we're not gonna really talk about boots yet not for a wee while yet but now you don't have to get two of six item slots filled by boots greaves and travels and can instead always just have a tp on hand um it's kind of lame but what do i know also because tp scroll and boots of travels have an independent cooldown with only one just adding plus 10 seconds to the other it means that you can teleport in and then after 10 seconds teleport to another lane which is kind of ember spirits thing so, um, is he shit now? Daily bonus heroes are gone! Honestly, awesome. Bringing back randoming, it should have never left. You can also have more confidence in randoming too. It's now kind of hard to say that you shouldn't random all the time. Although people are going to try and tell you that. I was already saying before all this that you should random all the time. Random every game, chaos in the streets, hey man. I mean, at least your games aren't boring, right? But honestly, the fact that randoming ignores your 25 least played heroes just means that you have the ability to random a hero you know you have played before. This is both good and bad. It's bad in the sense that back in the day, randoming was the official way to decide which new hero you were going to learn. You randomed, you landed on a hero you'd never played before, and it, you pretty much just jumped in the deep end with it. You learn how to play that hero immediately, or you lose. It was fun. But with this type of randoming, you are guaranteed to land on a hero that you could probably play along with the mangoes and all the bonuses that you get from the now removed daily hero bonus thing, in theory. In practice, you might absolutely suck at your most played hero. Hey man, it, I mean, it happens. Your most played is Lone Druid. You've got a 30% win rate with Lone Druid because everybody has a 30% win rate with Lone Druid. Well, hey man, at least you've got some mangoes to add to that loser smoothie. And of course, randoming can now only be done for the first two heroes of each team, which I'll reluctantly say is a good idea. We've all been known to be alt-tabbed watching that hot boy toy streamer to then come back and find that we've got five seconds left to pick the last hero of the draft and you weren't paying attention and you have no idea what to counter pick. Hey man, randoming was the way to go back then. But for everyone's sake, maybe it's a good idea to remove that specific part of it. TP scrolls can be cancelled by ruse. Okay, um, awesome. But beyond that, every old root ability can no longer cancel channels other than TP scroll. Does that mean that Enigma's back on the menu, boys? The answer to Enigma, when you didn't have a vengeful spirit, it was, you know, to have a guy happily volunteer getting Helm of the Dominator. That is, in a bizarro world where he wasn't already going to get it anyway. <laughs> but that's impossible. And then, of course, for that Dominator carrier to dominate a Dark Troll Summoner, 
specifically for its ensnare. But that won't work anymore, friend. Cleave damage is now honestly where it probably should have been the entire time for simplicity's sake. It was always that weird hard to explain thing of dealing damage that was physical but wasn't also reduced by armor which is supposed to reduce physical but and you know how it goes but so this basically means not much. You didn't really have a plan around not buying armor because Cleave ignores it anyway because you're rarely if ever being hit by Cleave when they're trying to kill you and if they're trying to kill a teammate that isn't you to have you get splashed by Cleave as a collateral, they're probably clearly going for a guy who they deem is more important to kill than you anyway. And again, does this mean Ember's bad? For the longest time, I noted to myself how much BKB kind of does less and less as every ability gets more and more powerful on account of the constant power creep. The fastest way to make an ability better is to make it go through magic community, but it got to a point where it was considered odd for a spell to not go through magic community. And 720, it seems like they're going out of their way to reverse all of that and make Black King bars great again. The big ones are Bloodseeker's Blood Rage, Lone Druid's Bears and Tangle, Tidehunter's Anchor Smash Damage Reduction Aspect, and of course all of the roots mentioned earlier. Black King Bar is understandably slightly more expensive to compensate but by like 5 cents, so that's fine by me. Poison Sting being dispellable is a dream though, but a nightmare awaits when we talk about the fact that with Strong Dispel, Hex is also dispellable. Oh, did you hear that? I hear something in the shadows dancing. And then just to rattle off the miscellaneous changes. Day night cycle increased from four minutes to five minutes. Oh! Scan no longer ignores units in the Roshan pit. You'd be amazed to see how little this would change. I think it's more the dice frog felt bad watching thousands and thousands of wasted scans that were put directly on the Rosh pit that he just sort of decided what the heck and allowed it to actually work. Max attack speed is now 700, meaning that Ursa and Windranger have yet again been given major buffs. Keep in mind that they can reach max attack speed with nearly no items, so it's pretty much just overall a damage and prop chance increase. It also ties into Alchemist's ultimate beast mode, as well as, I hear, a certain pair of ogres with a certain golden glove. And maybe a certain fish boy too, but we'll get to that soon. Wow, uh, I just went on about aura items and the joke that every single aura item has a range of 900. And bam, the next update, it's immediately changed. As the specific Patreon pledges of my audience, you guys already know all about my thoughts on aura items. Now all of a sudden, Radiance has more range, mech, vlads, all sorts. And it's not just a case of 300 extra range, even though that's what's written, because this is a radius of a circle we're talking about here. The area of influence we have with an aura of 1200 versus 900 is crazy. A 900 radius is 2,540,000 units. A 1200 radius is 4,520,000. Nearly double. <laughs> Math, am I right? I hate it, and I can't escape it! I mean, come on, man, why can't the subjects I liked at school come up when talking about Dota? When do I get to make an analogy about home ec, about cooking scones? At least I know something about that. Moving on, reading added a new sound that gets played when all of a team's barracks are destroyed makes me think Ice Frog's been watching some Todd Howard video recordings. Or Todd Vods, as the cool kids call them. And you can design for this. How people feel when they have accomplished something themselves in your game is this feeling of pride that nothing else in entertainment can give you. And you can design for this moment, even simple things, puzzle games. My favorite sort of ego stroking design to make you feel great moment in any game is Peggle. Have you, everybody here played Peggle? Have you finished a level? If you haven't, all levels end this way. I'm pretty great. I think I'll play another level. Basically, it just offers a satisfying sound to go along with the plain and simple text telling you, you have mega creeps. For those of you unfortunate enough to have heard that sound when it's your team getting those megas, this is what it sounds like. The other fellas been around. like we got a case of mega creeps. Satisfying, right? But not as satisfying as Ice Frog finally, finally letting your teammates know when you kill an observer ward. Finally. You'll notice in the official text it says allies, whereas I specifically said teammates. And that's deliberate. But that's it for general. Alright, part 1 of 99 down, time for a scone break. Ooh, let's talk about items! I'm sure this segment will whiz by, it's not like every single thing we've ever known has fundamentally changed, causing every single one of my old videos to now become obsolete. <laughs> Boohoo! And to think I nearly managed to make a guide for every single hero. But ha! Now I just get to make every video I've ever done, again, for infinite money. 
So let's go! Firstly, every single boots item has been tweaked, which compounds with the fact that speed bonuses have been tweaked too. Some obviously haven't been tweaked directly, they're like no changes have happened to those boots, but the scenarios in which you pick them up have changed. And anyway, okay, considering how core boots are to the entirety of the game, this section should probably come first on account of it also interfering with every other item beyond this. To begin, no item in the actual game gives static movement speed buffs anymore. Every single movement speed item is a percentage based movement speed item now, which is just like the fat cats at Valve. It's just what they do. This inequality is what's driving the Dota society towards this partisan system and I'm, I'm just so ashamed. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The heroes who are already blessed with fantastic movement speed at the start of the game have the ability to benefit more through the rest of the game. Crystal made him buying boots of travel with a 275 movement speed means that she ends up with 363. But a goddamn privileged partner with 335 base movement speed all of a sudden ends up with 442. A 107 increase versus an 88 increase. Pathetic. It also means that Boots of Speed, Treads, Phase, and Arcanes all give the exact same movement speed. Earlier they were all ever so slightly different, and Tranquils, even when active, which we'll learn is even harder to achieve, grant more movement speed than all of them. The boots of Travel still reign supreme. Unless, of course, you use Phase Boots with their new ability. It's now a passive movement speed buff that gives an extra plus 10% or plus 20% depending on if you're ranged or melee. That's added on to the 15% buff they inherently already get, so that's already suddenly more than travels. That's big. This is the first time it's ever happened. To achieve it though, you have to actively target an enemy 900 units or closer. Doing so gives you a turn rate increase, unless you already have a turn rate of 1, like a lot of heroes do anyway, so uh, bum deal dude. Phoenix, Pango, Shadowfin, Lifestealer, Bat and more. There's, there's loads of heroes in the game right now who miss out on the turn rate increase, and a lot of them even used to go phase boots as well. Used to. Now I don't even know anymore. Phase boots, in fact all of the boots have been completely changed so this next bit might be a mess until the end but we ultimately have an epiphany and understand exactly the class of hero that would go out and get each and every single one of these new boots. Don't get me wrong, the boots still do what their name suggests. You can still phase with phase boots but you can't activate it willy nilly anymore. It only activates when you click on an enemy in 900 units and that phase can extend in perpetuity. It has no cooldown, it has no limited duration and the buff lingers for a half a second. As long as not a half second goes by when you're not attack commanding on an enemy, you are perpetually phased. The big change is that phase boots, the item for unadulterated early game damage, no longer gives damage. They now give 5 armor, which no boots beyond greaves could give. How very strange! 25 attack speed, that's less than what treads gives you. We could clearly just keep buying treads. Treads is the new best boot in the game, except treads no longer give attack speed. They in fact give damage. 16 damage. So, uh, so what? Okay, treads and phase are now phase and treads, I guess. I, 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 I don't get this. I don't really know what this means. I mean, treads still has its claim to fame in that you can set them to int, agility, and strength, and get the 10 attribute bonus, except now it's 12. So in reality, if you set them to agility, and were an agility carry, you're getting plus 28 damage from them, and plus 12 attack speed, even though it doesn't give attack speed, because it's giving you agility. That's arguably better than old treads and old phase, because it's pretty much just both of them combined now. Treads are... I think now the greatest item in the game. Not only do they maintain the ability to give more mana, more strength, more attack speed and armor, they also offer plus 28 damage to any hero, provided they have the boots set to their primary attribute. Whatever hero you used to get phase on, you can pretty much just buy treads on. And unless the primary reason you were buying treads on a hero was specifically for the awesome attack speed, perhaps you're a faceless void or another hero with a proc chance, you're still better off buying treads. If you are really desperate for both armor phase and the attack speed, just go phase. But honestly, there are probably more heroes outside of that vendor diagram than in it. Off the top of my head, I could probably list the heroes that would want new phase over new traits. Legion Commander, Ursa, Bloodseer, Lifestealer. Ta-da! In all honesty, the most important part of all of this is that 5 armor. Boots with armor is an amazing thing. Tranquil Boots used to have them ages ago, and they were rightfully nerfed because it was really powerful. You'll notice all four of those heroes listed are frontlining melee heroes who depend on that armor. There is the potential that I'm really wrong about everything that I've just said, and that Phase Boots secretly becomes the most important boots for every single squishy slow support. Maybe rushing these on Crystal Maiden will manage to bring her win rate up to 90%. Only time will tell but I could probably make an at least educated call and say probably not. And the reason for that is because Tranquil Boots are no longer disabled when attacking creeps, which instantly makes these the best boots for everyone ever. I, I know I just said that about treads, but I, like, I'm going through this in pretty much the same order as it's displayed in the patch notes, so there's the potential that I say that every item and every hero is the best hero in the game if they at least trump the item or hero just listed before them. Don't get ahead of yourself with Tranks though, they're still disabled by attacking a hero or when you are attacked by any unit, including creeps. The change is simple 
simply that it doesn't happen when you yourself are attacking creeps. On lane, as long as you understand how to keep creeps from aggroing on you, you are fine. Unless of course a hero sends one attack your way at at least every 13 seconds, and therein lies the rub, right? The same thing goes for jungle creeps too. If you are being attacked, tranks are less useful. If you're not being attacked, they're perfect. So that means that these are the best boots for a ranged hero compared to a melee hero. And the longer range you have, the greater hero you are with them. Yeah, I mean, you know where this is all leading, because obviously I'm bringing this all together to segue into Phoenix. Phoenix, for example, is a ranged spell-based hero who nearly universally rushes tranquil boots. His, or her, range is pretty awesome. Not her attack range, but the range of his spells, which is primarily what she uses to farm. The problem is that he's constantly nearly killing creeps with fire spirits, and then either has to drop her tranks for the last attack, disable his tranks for the last attack, or wait, do neither, and finish off the creeps with the next fire spirits charge 20 seconds later. But now all of a sudden, it's possible to 100% speed run the jungle dropping a fire spirit and auto attacking while those creeps are unable to attack due to the attack speed slow that's already attached to the damage of those fire spirits. Heroes who sit around and farm constantly also don't need to buy more regen because tranks covers it. Lunas, shadow fiends, snipers, all of these heroes could potentially build tranks, I wouldn't say they should, Overall, I like this change, but then again, obviously, because I'm a Phoenix fan, so of course I would, right? What I am not a fan of is this insistence on making status resistance a major part of Dota. I was fine with it only being attached to Aeon Disc. Well, no, actually, that was a lie. I was fine with it not existing in Dota at all. I could put up with it being only attached to Aeon Disc and Tiny, but now my beautiful Sanj has lost the ability to maim, and like an awesome slowing ability, and everything that is built out of Sanj has now also lost maim and been given status resistance. Boo! I love Sanj and you've soiled it. Status resistance isn't fun. It, it's simply not fun. It doesn't give more of an option for play and counterplay to compensate for the lack of fun. It's just a feature added to the game that has a net loss in terms of engagement. I, for the life of me, j j wouldn't be able to explain why it was added. To reiterate my thoughts really quickly, because I've talked about this a lot, before status resistance there was an immense amount of skill and finesse directly connected to the ability to be able to be the most efficient you could possibly be in chaining stuns. A 4 second stun meant exactly 4 seconds, and familiarizing yourself with that number and acclimating your muscle memory to chain a sun as close to the end of that four seconds but not further was a genuine and lauded skill but now it's next to impossible every hero by virtue of it being intrinsically tied to strength could have a wildly different perception of how long four seconds actually is for a debuff and i hate it it's just random chance for stuns to chain now and we lost a maim to get this <laughs> But that's not all bad, because while Sanj has had this change, it's also had a change tied into finally becoming item to pair up with Kaya, which is awesome. Without even reading it here, you could already, you know, sort of predict the usefulness. Sanj and Yasha is an awesome item for most heroes. It's nearly a jack of all trades item. It is. It's, it's one of the best items for all random deathmatch because of how well it pairs up with most heroes. But it doesn't pair up with all heroes. What happens when you're a strength hero who needs more int and spell amp? Sanjinyasha can't really help you there. What if you're an int carry who needs attack speed and armor? Well, Sanjinyasha can't help you there either. But now there is literally a variation of Sanjinyasha for every hero in the game, Asterix. I know you in the comments will be filled with heroes that these don't work on, so I'm preparing beforehand. But that's right, newly added in 720 is Yasha and Kaya and Kaya and Sanj. Which, from an ordering perspective, just makes absolutely no sense. Sanj comes before Yasha, Yasha comes before Kaya, but Kaya comes before Sanj? I hate this game, it's trash. But basically Sanj and Yasha pretty much does the exact same thing it always had. It still, it still gives the classic sweet 16 stats it's always had. 16 strength, 16 agility, 16 agility speed, and now uh, 16 status resistance. And pretty much all three of these items do the same with their respective stats. It's actually kind of confusing in a sense. Sanj and Yasha gave movement speed and health and all that. It was either that or Manta, and it was usually pretty clear which was the best. But now you have at least two options for every single stat. Do you want more movement speed? Well, okay, well get Sanj and Yasha. Or Yasha and Kaya to get the exact same movement speed. Or do you want int or strength more? Okay, well, if you want int, then you can go Yasha and Kaya, or Kaya and San. Oh. Both give int and spell amps and mana loss reduction, but do you want more status resistance as well? Or do you perhaps want movement speed instead? Well, in that case, get Sarge and yeah. And then you get my point. Honestly, it's just confusing and unnecessary that I'm certain that Valve had, I don't know, some sort of ulterior motive for adding three variations on this. Uh, wait, th three? Three of them? It couldn't be. Oh my god, I think we're onto something. Before we go mad, I'll just touch on two more items and then we'll take another breath. The first of which is Ring of Tarask. I've never admitted this, but every single time a new item has been added to the game, I give it a few days and then check Dota buff to see the trends for that item. 
on all of the heroes. It's always fascinating to see what the Vox Populi is, because Ring of Taras gives 3.75 HP regen, 150 health, and is cheaper than Ring of Health, the gold standard for basic HP regen items. And so logically, the Dota community has been smart and rushed it on Pudge and Axe and Bristle and Sensor and... No, no, you've fallen, you've fallen for the trap, guys. You've, you've seen that it gives health and equated it with high HP items in order to be more tanky, but it's a static amount of HP. It'd actually end up being an amazing item for low HP heroes. Crystal Maiden, Jakiro, and Skyrath, and low and behold, they top the win rates. To be fair, it's only been a couple of days, but I mean, we'll check it back again later. And also, because it builds into something that we're about to touch on, you should be getting on our heroes that also are wanting the next item. Beyond Ring, there's also Holy Locket, which is built out of it, so this will also influence who picks it up. Holy Locket causes all heals and HP regen you provide to be amplified by 25%. All heals on anything, as long as the sources you will be amped 25%. Holy Locket is 2,650 gold. It has a pretty mid-tier buildup that should be possible for most heroes, and gives 200 health, 4 HP regen, 3 mana regen, and 50% magic resistance. This is an awesome, awesome support item. Bezel, Oracle, Phoenix, Huskar? We'll talk about Huskar, but there's another bigger elephant in the room. An old friend. You might know him as Solar Crest. Solar Crest. What the heck happened to Solar Crest? What on earth is happening with Solar Crest right now? Okay, to set the scene, Solar Crest before 720 was built out of a medallion and a talisman of evasion. It gave armor evasion, and upon targeting it on an enemy, that hero lost 10 armor and had their evasion lowered by 40%. Or to be like technical, it was like an accuracy thing of 40%. It's kind of dumb all around. Most heroes don't innately have evasion, so it was really just the armor thing. Solar Crest has been my favorite item in many, many patches, but the last few patches before 720 were not some of them. The old, old Solar Crest gave a mischance as well as an armor reduction as everybody knows because I used to talk about it all the time and things were good but now now solar crest consists of a medallion that's a given but no talisman of evasion and instead an ultimate orb a wind lace and a measly 300 gold recipe it's now nearly 4k gold but lord almighty it's worth it it now gives 10 stats 12 armor 6 percent movement speed on a 350 movement speed hero that's about 20 movement speed extra and 1.5 mana region awesome stats no complaints but the active dude the active the new active can be cast on allies and enemies as to be expected and upon doing so it removes your plus 12 armor bonus which is also to be expected but then it gives your allies 70 attack speed plus 10 movement speed and plus 12 armor on enemies it takes those three things away what the hell right <laughs> not only does it yet again act as one of the best armor reduction items in the game it also for some reason slows and drops attack speed by nearly two shiva's guards solar crest removes a hyperstone and a half from your enemies and grants one to your allies why? I have no idea. What's Ice Frog's motivation for all of this? Fact if I know, is insanely overpowered? Absolutely yes. And are we going to complain? Oh no, no we're not. What we're going to do is we're going to stop talking you louder about this completely. We're not going to mention that this is one of the greatest items in the game. We're not going to talk about it being overpowered to the point of it being unfair and calling for a nerf. What we're going to do is just go on about our day as if nothing is out of the ordinary. You understand, friend? We're just going to be nice and calm. Now. Let's perhaps do some theory crafting about who Solar Crest would be good on. Hmm? I think that's a good idea. It's in a very odd position of being around the same price as a BKB, while also being an item that the user himself doesn't get the best bonuses out of. So we're in this no man's land between it being a support item because of its assets when given to an ally, and also it being a carry item because it takes a lot of farm to get. So obviously your first thought would be, oh right, so then utility heroes, heroes that aren't quite carry and aren't quite supports, offlaners and aura users and that sort of thing. And if you did think that, then in any other scenario, you'd be absolutely right. But here, in the only way to play, you're not as right as you could be, because in the Solar Crest text, it says ally, not allied hero. An ally that we could perhaps move ourselves? An ally that could both benefit from 70 attack speed while also being controlled by us? You know it, dude. We're bringing back Helm of the Dominator 2. Oh, <laughs> dominate the ghost creep. Barrel on down with a 12 extra armor, 70 attack speed. It's also fantastic on extremely oddball heroes that you wouldn't even necessarily expect. I mean, bear with me here. I want you to imagine the damage you can do with these on Lone Druid, chucking it on the bear. Put it on Lone Druid and use the active on the bear. As long as you're not being attacked, it doesn't matter that the armor is gone because you're not even losing any stats either. Like the plus 10 stats from the ultimate orb aren't removed or anything. Nothing is being removed other than the armor. You're not, you're not losing any movement speed or anything. It's so stupid. And like, I don't want to get into spoiler territory or anything, but Lone Druid has changes that also benefit from this. Dude, chuck it on the bear. Go Lone Druid Solar Crest. Go it on Arc Warden. Go it on Meepo. These are, these are crazy strats that have never been possible before, but they work surprisingly well. Solar Crest gives stats, gives movement speed, and on all three of these heroes that I just mentioned, you can alternate between putting it on an ally and then putting it on the enemy. Lone Druid's bear being brought down in two hits by that lifestealer, chuck Solar Crest on him and remove his 12 armor and make him a 
attack 70 points slower. Solar Crest is the breakout item of this patch, and for the sake of brevity, I have to stop. I can't do it justice in diving into each and every one of the scenarios in which Solar Crest would be inarguably the best item for your hero, so I'll leave you with this one thing. Io. Necro 3. Solar Crest. With the Necro Warrior getting boosted movement speed due to Solar Crest and Io tethering to him, Io also gets that movement speed. With Necro Warrior's low base attack down, that 70 attack speed is doubly strong on him. Because of that level 25 talent and overcharge and tether, Io also gets the attack speed bonuses from Solar Crest and they're doubly strong on him. And because of that, you were able to watch this footage behind me of an Io and a Necronomicon squad barreling on down a lane and taking the Ancient before they even expire. With the only tampering of the footage being to change the speed ever so slightly so it ends as I say. I think it's safe to say I love Solar Crest again. I don't know if I really agree that one crown is worth 450 gold. If 450 gold is equal to one crown, and one crown is, as of the day that this was written, 19th of November, worth 0.11 US cents, then that means that 38 gold, the average gold for a normal melee creep, is only worth 0.0092 US dollars. That is literally the value of a creep's life. And that, my friends in Fano, is very sad indeed. The Dota economy is built on blood. Overthrow the system. Steal from the shopkeepers. On a side note, wouldn't that be fun? A mini game where you could attempt to steal from the shopkeepers with an extremely low chance of success and an extremely high chance that you would fail and uh, then get turned into the creep for the rest of the game. It'd be fun. It'd make playing from behind even more risky and rewarding if you managed to get a free Divine Rapier. And it would be an entirely lore accurate, which is, I think, a magical thing in Dota because upon looking at the game, it might just be the only thing in the game that is actually accurate to the lore. But enough about how Shadowfiend can somehow gain souls from Windranger. Let's actually talk about Crown. Crown is the new stat item. Plus 4 to all stats, so an alternative to the old magic wand everybody bought. 450 gold and is used as the component of every item that previously called for Bracer, Wraithband, Nalp Talisman. So let's talk about those three items too. Firstly, Ring of Aquila has been completely removed from the game. Well, that's one way of dealing with it, can't say I'm surprised. I mean, something drastic was going to happen sooner or later. Maybe I'm a bit accusatory when it comes to thinking that there was probably a better way to go about this, but that would of course take more time and energy. <laughs> so sure, burn it down, throw it in the bin, be done with it. You'd assume that that would mean a massive nerf to edgy carries, but you'd be dead wrong. While Bracer, Wraithband, and Null Talisman all stop building into other items, they do offer way more stats all up that have been buffed. Wraithband gives 16 attack speed and 8 damage on agility heroes, and two of them give 32 and 16 each. Quiller is gone, but for the same price, you now get 16 damage and 32 attack speed, as well as obviously the 6 strength and int. It's like those boss battles in old video games when you finally cut off the head of that final enemy, only to discover that it has a second, more deadly phase right after it. Remove a Quiller for being too powerful and giving 16 damage, and you're left with Wraith Bands remaining in the game and giving double that. The pain train has no breaks. Basically get 6 Wraith Bands on Meepo and win at 10 minutes. Enjoy. Bracer gives 8 strength, one more than it used to, as well as a 6% magic resistance, which is nice. Stacking two of these isn't as good as Wraith Band, but it still gives at least 288 extra health, and the nearly equivalent of a cloak's worth of magic resistance. Building two of these is extremely more inefficient though. They've nerfed the classic 3 Bracer into Radovato's drums combo with Bracers not building into anything obviously, as I just said, so you'll have to really consider the dead end that is itemizing towards Bracers for early game stats, with the negative being it taking more gold to get your next big item purchase right after that. And same with Null Talisman, unless you're Skywrath Mage. Null Talisman gives 8 int, but each one gives a, <laughs> a plus 3% a plus spell amp. Let me remind you that Kaya only gives 8% spell amp, and that's at 2000 gold. Pick Skywrath Mage, stack 5 Null Talismans, and again, win at 10 minutes. Enjoy! But overall, this does spell the beginning of the end for these items. Not being able to be upgraded into other items later on is an extremely bad aspect of items. It's why Kaya was such a bad item before this patch. It's why Vlad's and Sol Ring aren't really picked up more. It's why Ring of Bessie will begin never being picked up. And it's sad to watch, you know? I've got a lot of fond memories of just clutched games because of these items. That extra bracer let me win, that fight on 20 HP, that extra Nell Talisman gave me enough mana to cast that life-saving blink on Quap. We've all got memories like that. And of course, the fallout of that means that every item built out of these items has changed. What's surprising is that I think universally, all of these items are buffed because of it. Ice Frog moves in mysterious ways. Dagon now gives more strength and agility while also being a whole 15, 1, 5 gold cheaper. And it's the same with all of these items. Rod of Atos is slowly turning into a good item for agility heroes too. Without much fanfare, it went from giving no agility a couple of updates back to a heaping 12 and 720. But I've always loved Atos, so I'm happy for the buff. Bloodstone can no longer let you suicide or deny, I guess is the PC term. It's also been kind of an odd item. I mean, Bloodstone is an item that's built on Storm Spirit, and, and Storm Spirit, um, 
and Storm Spirit. It's never really been the best item to get for any other hero, while also somehow being the corest of core items for Storm Spirit. So it's in this odd position of wanting to be buffed enough to be viable for other heroes, while also not being buffed so much that Storm Spirit becomes a god while holding it. So instead of buffing or nerfing it, they've reworked it. It no longer reduces respawn times, which sucks for the category of Dota Cinema that specifically relied on clips of Tempestor chaining and dying and coming flying through, but I guess the instant respawn was patched out a while back anyway, so while now it completely leaves you respawn alone. Doing well and dying won't let you snowball as much as it did when your death was made less of a big deal by the fact that you were up two seconds later. In fact, snowballing has taken a really weird hit all around. You start with 12 charges, with death removing a static 3, no matter how many charges you had before. If you have 99 charges, you fall to 96, as opposed to 99 falling to 66 in the old system. It's a lower risk, lower reward item that gives HP regen per charge as well as mana. Might this perhaps mean that this item works on snowballing strength heroes too? I, I mean, Axe and Tusk and the like? Maybe not, but I mean, it still seems like a pretty bad item for non-Storm Spirit heroes, but I don't know, there was an attempt. And finally, to replace the Pocket Deny, you could cast Bloodstone to siphon 60% of your current mana and making it into health over 2 seconds. It's like when the Aegis expires, except un cancelable. I like that. Instead of advocating for taking the easier way out, they've made it an item that's better for holding on for dear life even more. That's a positive change for the world in my book. Just a shame it'll never be picked up. Okay, let's just get through all of these already. Aeon Disc doesn't give immunity, but gives 50% status resistance when it's activated. Uh, status resistance does nothing for damage, so sure, that 4 second stun will still become 2 seconds. 4 staff can override Slark's pounce, and might I say, finally, right? I and all my favourite people buy 4 staff in most games anyway, so I'm all for it being buffed. We'll talk about Slark and the new leash ability soon. Hand of Midas is now Core and Ogre Magi, and we'll talk about that soon. Sentry Ward range is buffed, awesome. Uh, Gem grants True Sight even when the wielder dies, which is a potentially huge buff for gem carriers anyway. The only way to disable that True Sight is to actually pick the item up, and you can't put gems in backpacks, so if you don't have a slot free, you'll be stumbling around trying to pocket it long enough for that dead gem carrier's team to kill you. But as we're wrapping up this item section, let's just end it on something stupid, eh? Right? You know how it grants 300 ground vision and true sight until it gets picked up? Well, uh, well, what if you just didn't pick it up? What if you, now bear with me on this, go out of your way to drop it on the cliffs and ward spots all around the map to perpetually give a whopping 300 vision and true sight? Forever though, forever! To do this six times it would only take you an hour for them to respawn, and gems don't go invisible when you drop them, so they can pretty much just be picked up by the enemy team at any time. But still, still, hypothetically, you could do it. And oh my god, now we finally know why Ice Frog left those pits and rocks waterable. It's to hide gems in there for that secret constant true sight. And here I was thinking that it was just an oversight and that the developers of Dota had just bad at their jobs. <laughs> Please don't tell them I said that. I feel like it's necessary to say that I've skipped ahead and have read these notes over and over again, so I sort of know what I'm about to say before I actually officially get to writing this part of the video. But there are genuinely people out there who depend on these only way to play guides so much that they don't ever read the updates, hoping that I will be able to translate all of the chaos into digestible chunks of useful information. First off, terrible idea. I'm just gonna focus on the dumbest of strats, you already know that. I mean, you are better to go to Sing Sing or Wagamama for that, but secondly, that would mean that there are potentially people watching this video right now who genuinely don't know what's about to come up. And for that reason alone, this video is gonna be an exciting one. No spoilers. Arising at A are Abaddon, Ancient Apparition, Anti-Mage, Ark, and Axe, all awesome articles adapted around ability adjustments. Arranged alphabetically, an agenda of analyses, arguments, and altercations are apparent, and unfortunately, alliteration is arduous, so let's just drop all that for now and get right into it. Abaddon, or Abaddon, has been given a rework to Curse of Avernus, he has other stuff, but I need to <laughs> I need to set a precedent here for not just making 15 minute episodes strictly to discuss a base movement speed increase from 310 to 325. If you really wanted something like that, I'll give you a cheat sheet for every single time a movement speed speed change happens, right? If the second number is bigger than the first number, that means it's good. And if it's not, that's bad. If any number goes over 295, the average move speed for most heroes, then they're very good. And when compounding an increase of movement speed onto a hero that literally slows people on hit and gains movement speed upon doing so, you might come to the conclusion that this guy is pretty broken. The new Curse of Averna still slows the target 10 to 25% for 4 seconds. Before this, it gave a move speed slow of 8 to 20% for 2.5 seconds, while also speeding up any person attacking that target. Now, if a target gets hit 4 times, which I might remind you is extremely easy when Abaddon runs faster and slows slower, that unit becomes silent and slowed for up to 60% movement speed and all units that are attacking that target gain up to 100 attack speed boost. Buff in the long run, slightly worse on the laning phase before Abaddon gets boots. But honestly, Ice Frog, <laughs> why? Was Abaddon bad? 
I made a guide from over a year ago with the exact kit that he still has in this update. And he was fine then. I mean, I'll, I'll trust that you know what you're doing, but this is a buff to an overbuffed hero. I guess what this means is you probably want to be the player on Abaddon's team rather than against him. Ancient Apparitions W has lost the self movement speed bonus though. You probably forgot he even had that. It was just a movement speed bonus equal to the movement speed slow on enemies that still remain. But only, but only on that tiny patch of ice. Barely noticeable, some of you might not have even known it was there until I mentioned that it was gone. He's also had Chilling Touch turned up to a passive attack modifier for just him. So no more Chilling Touch Meepo combos as much as we all love that. At level 4 it has a 3 second cooldown which coincidentally is the exact attack speed of an Ancient Apparition who was bullied out of lane and not able to farm because yes, Ancient Apparition is a farm dependent hero now. God. Damn it, and you better respect that. For 90 mana, it gives you up to 240 range, 155 extra magic damage, and a half second complete slow on that hit. It can also be toggled on and off, which, I mean, thank God, right? 90, 90 mana auto attacks that just couldn't be turned off for a nightmare. With all of this in mind, my first thoughts are that Ancient Apparition is an extremely long range hero that can even attack while dominating. While all of his spells cost loads of mana, he's potentially never really in danger, so items like Veil and Arcane Boots work well on him, while letting him skimp out on buying HP items. No attack speed items are really going to do much considering he peaks and troughs every 3 seconds, but Midas is still a staple of his, and it'll continue to be. Anti-Mage has lost his Scepter upgrade. <laughs> I mean, honestly, good, right? It was, it was stupid. Dude, even for 4200 gold, the ability to both block and reflect an enemy spell was just ludicrous and broken. I'm glad they got rid of it. He also got... Oh. Oh, no. Oh, oh no, 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 no. He got his eggs given to him for free. With a cooldown of 3 seconds and a mana cost of 40. Anti-Mage gains a Lotus Sword plus Lincolns for 1.4 seconds. Why? Basically what this means is that to lock him down you have to make him cast his counter spell shield early then wait and slip in the other disables in the 1.6 seconds between cooldowns. On the bright side it does mean that he has to actively remember to use it. It's not a passive anymore. So silences and instant stuns and all spells that can catch him while he's not really looking totally work here. The new plan seems to be getting shadow blades and laying in wait. Overall, as much as we can get hyperbolic on this channel, it's manageable and arguably better than the eggs that he had earlier. But obviously, <laughs> he didn't have to pay 4200 gold for this. Axe's Berserker's Call Armor bonus reducing from 40 to 30 means surprisingly little. A 10 armor loss could be major, but from like 9 armor to negative 1, it's going to have far more of an impact than from 40 to 30. You know? In fact, I think it's actually possible with the new formula for armor now to actually genuinely hit 100% armor. Not 100 armor, 100% armor. Like, taking zero damage. Uh, I don't think you can really do it on axe though. You can get really, really close, but I feel like probably the best way to do it would be with someone with a really ludicrous armor buff. Like, Monkey King has one for his level 25 talent in his Wukong's command. <laughs> That's 100 armor, and then if you got 6 Shiva's Guard, yeah, you'd probably hit that mark and take absolutely no damage. But then, of course, <laughs> you know, you've got six Shivas, so maybe it's not the best strat. Bane's Enfeeble now adds a negative status resistance to it. Huh, I wonder if I'm okay with that. Um, it, it, it might be a little early to say, but maybe I am. The idea of a spell on a support hero amplifying disables and debuffs on his team's enemies is actually kind of neat. We've already got Skyrath and Rubick and Shadow Demon amping potential damage to an enemy hero. I mean, obviously we're not rushing ahead. I mean, in 719, they might have been changed. I mean, I know that they would change, but shh for pacing and all that. Let's pretend like they aren't yet because we haven't gotten to them. Anyway, but Bane being able to amp potential debuffs seems to fall naturally into his sort of pre-established kit, you know? I'll get back to you on this. I I'm a little saddened to see that it no longer steals damage but instead reduces attack speed. But then again, I played Bane as mid, if you recall, so that strat's on its way out. 100 attack speed is major though, and arguably more important than damage. There are a lot of heroes in the game who have attack modifiers that don't get reduced by physical damage debuffs. Ancient Apparition is a hero that we just talked about. Any hero with an item that gives him a proc chance doesn't necessarily worry about it. OD doesn't worry about it. Lots of heroes should just shake it off. But all heroes that attack can be nerfed by slowing those attacks. Even Ursa and Elk. Doubly so for Elk. A lower base attack time means attack speed items do more and attack speed slows do more. But Enfeeble has never really been Bane's signature spell, so only time will tell if it will be now. I doubt it. I will say that his level 5 talent of stealing the 100 attack speed you reduce does give him a bit of leeway in justifying purchasing a Divine Rapier. So you know what? Yeah, I think it's actually a great change. Rush Rapier 
easier on paying every game. Bat Rider's Lasso giving DPS without eggs is inarguably amazing. <laughs> there are very, very few heroes that DPS means more than on Bat Rider. Sticky Napalm can amp now every single spell that Bat Rider has, and I'm all for it. I like to always use three Sticky Napalms as the average amount to assume that you can put on someone in a team fight. You never get set, but you never just get one, so it has to be somewhere in between. Three seems fair, maybe a little on the low end. With three level four Sticky Napalm charges, you deal 540 magical damage during a level three Flaming Lasso, while also stunning him for four seconds. With no Sticky Napalm charges, you deal just 240. And of course, for a bit of fun, a hypothetical in which you cover a target in 10 Sticky Napalm charges means you're about able to deal 1,240 damage. Now, see what happens when you add Firefly, Meteor, Hammer, Veil, and Kaya to the equation. Beastmaster was always bizarre. His name is goddamn Beastmaster, and all he can do is summon a pigeon and a pig with a fucking cold. They then changed it so he could summon a random neutral creep, which was even weirder because what if you just got that shitty tomato one? No, I mean, no offense, shitty tomato one, but I would have preferred the elf one. I mean, everybody does. Beastmaster is an awkward hero and has been for a very, very long time. He's also never played, so I guess changes don't really need to come as fast as maybe a pudge. I was extremely close to making an only way to play specifically, pushing for ignoring Call of the Wild completely, and playing him as an attack speed or a legend with an amazing ultimate stun. But that took a back seat. Now we're at a point again where Boar and Hawk are able to be summoned independently, which, mm, yes, is good. It was weird for it to be anything but. Boar is pretty much the same, overall stronger, but Hawk is majorly different. Same cooldown, same mana cost, but now you can only control it once, and that's when casting it. Upon cast, you click exactly where you want it to end up, and then until it dies, it will stay there, unmoving. You spawn it from Beastmaster and it will fly directly in a straight line to the place that you click. And then, and then you can't move it around. It's great early because it's always invisible, but having a mobile ward was such a massive appeal of the ability that you now no longer have. Ignoring all else, it'll make sending a hawk into the enemy base and boots of traveling into it to backdoor the ancient win the game much, much harder. I don't know about this change, but then again, as I said, nobody plays Beastmaster before this anyway and nobody will play him after it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Area that I did play though, is of course Bloodseek. His thirst no longer gives damage, which boo, already kind of sucks for early game laning shenanigans, and instead just gives attack speed. It does give more movement speed for what it's worth, but you know, while damage can never cap, attack speed can. This is a nerf, requiring Bloodseeker to itemize towards damage before he's actually considered a good hero in that game. He'd be a good advocate for the new Wraith bands, really, and to be fair, it does help justify that juicy, juicy Radiance rush. Radiance? gives damage. Holy Lock it onto that also works, you know, because giving amped health and a lot can work with BS. It's very, it's very, very hard to completely trash him in a patch. Blood Rage's incoming and outcoming damage has been reduced to nearly half, which is sad. His Rupture, however, makes me very, very happy, so it balances out. Let me explain. Okay, so Rupture used to deal damage based off of 60% of the units moved in a second, unless you traveled more than 1300 or something. So if you traveled 1000 units, you took 600 damage, pretty understandable. So if you had 600 HP, you would die. If you had 6 billion HP, you're probably already winning, but you'd also end up with 5,999,999,400 health. So obviously this translates to good early game, worse late game. But in 720, it deals 8% of your current health per 100 units traveled and is no longer lethal. Because, I mean, obviously it can't be lethal. At a point you'll have 1 HP and you can't remove 8% of 1 HP in Dota. What this means is that it's now better in the late game, and while it can't kill anymore, it does a hell of a lot of an awesome job getting an enemy hero to a point where Thirst starts to kick in. The first 100 units traveled will take a fully healed enemy down to 92%, and it'll slowly do less and less and less. Luckily for us, Bloodseek is probably the hero most okay with his enemies getting extremely low, but not dying. It is a nerf in the technical sense, just like all of Bloodseek spells this patch. But as I said, I think you'll manage. But past Bloodseek, God, does, does Icebrook just hate the concept of a support now? He's so far converting all of them into selfish carries. Bounty Hunter's many, many buffs include Shadow Walk no longer dealing damage, but to compensate, Janata now lets you deal plus 170 attack damage every three seconds, while also stealing 30 unreliable gold at max level from enemy heroes. Stealing, as in you gain 30 and they lose 30. That's not just a last hit, that's two last hits. It's a 60 gold differential every 30 seconds, which means that this is absolutely, strictly, for efficiency's sake, the spell that you want to max out before all else, but constantly have it proc every 30 seconds. And then of course you just build 12 tangos and you just constantly build regen. You, have, you, need, you need no damage, you need nothing. All you need to do is constantly survive and constantly be hitting people. That's all you need. It gets even worse because even if they don't have any gold, if they have zero unreliable gold, attacking them still gives you plus 30. They can't give you anything, but you're still gaining gold. I don't know how that works. I don't know why that's fair, but it's in there and uh, in Ice Frog we trust, right? Right? This 
is stupidly dumb. <laughs> What's more is that the track bonuses apart from gold bounty are only given to you, but those track bonuses allow all attacks on a track unit to crit for up to 1.8 times the damage, and can be cast while invis. So that means with no items but a max out Janata and track, you can track from invis a target, then immediately attack out of the invis via Janata and deal exactly 522 damage to a zero armor target, and then 522 again in 3 seconds, and again in 6 seconds without items. And all the while, you're siphoning his few pennies that he's managed to scrounge since the last time Bounty Hunter came along. You're a bad person if you do this. But hey man, it's in the game. I, I just hope you're ready to lose your soul. And finally, for B, Brewmaster. By the end of this part of the video, we've only managed to make it through two letters, which is a frightening thing to notice. But ignoring all that, Drunken Brawler is now no longer a passive crit and evasion, which is frightening to notice. Oh god, I've been talking for so long I'm repeating myself. And finally for B, Brewmaster. By the end of this part of the video, we've only managed to make it through two letters, which is a frightening thing to notice. But ignoring all that, Drunken Brawl is now no longer a passive crit and evasion, which is a frightening thing to notice. Oh god, I've, I've been talking for so long I'm repeating myself. What a frightening thing to no- No! Okay, so I can finish this part. Drunken Brawler is instead now a 5 second buff, offering 80% evasion and an 80% chance to crit for 260% damage. What the hell? Like every hit? What the fuck? Why even itemize for your ult when you can just get Echo Saber, Solo Crest, Desolator and get 50 crits with 50 hits in 5 seconds? <gasps> broken spell. And also broken, but in a more perplexing way, is Brewmaster's new Drunken Haze replacement, Cinderbrew. It does no damage, but slows for 25% and gives an enemy a 35% chance to attack themselves, which is hilarious to witness when it's a centaur war and killing himself with his own return. But the kicker is that if, while in it, that enemy gets hit by any fire spell, they ignite and burn for up to 55 DPS. But what the hell counts as fire damage? Sure, Lena and Batrider, but what about Tinker's laser? Is that not a concentrated form of heat energy? See, Ice Frog, as soon as you start trying to incorporate realism into a game without it for decades, you invite pedantic wankers like me to pick it all apart. Are you sure you want to do this? Whew. Alrighty. Two letters down, 22 more to go. Why 22, you ask? Well, we already covered O and P in the Bounty Hunter section. In the last section with Brewmaster, I referenced Centaur Warrunner and his return. I knew he didn't have return anymore, but I knew you didn't know that yet, and I got away with it too. That'll teach you to trust me, ha ha ha. that's a that's a bad thing. Um, uh, keep watching my videos, do trust me. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I promise I'll never lie to you again. Well anyway, Centaur Warrunner has now had his percentage of strength to damage thingy tacked onto his double edge instead of his retaliate. Retaliate being the new name for return. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Retaliate return. Retaliate no longer deals damage depending on your strength, and now instead deals a flat 64 damage per attack. Which seems like an incredibly broken amount if you just rush the spell first, right? You also, with every attack, gain a charge up to 13. So every attack gives you a stack and also deals damage. You're not mishearing, that's actually true. But every charge, when finally activated, gives a plus 15% base damage increase. And no matter how many stacks, the effect lasts for 20 seconds with a cooldown of 40. You know how a 1.8 times crit on Janata is considered amazing? So amazing that it is made into his ultimate yeah well fuck all that because with 13 stacks you can get 20 seconds of constantly constantly 2.95 times more damage on every single one of your base attacks with six hearts you can deal 1416 damage per hit just with retaliate and now just imagine what happens when your teammate gets that new solar crest or that new abaddon applies his new curse of avernus honestly <laughs> it just seems that this patch is constantly buffing heroes who really did not need them it's like Icefrog wanted to buff one of his favorite heroes but that hero was already so powerful so to balance it he to buff all heroes to an OP status to hide the fact. But then of course that begs the question, who is Ice Frog's favorite hero? Hmm, the best way to deal with power creep is to make sure that all heroes get hit by the power creep. It's like in The Incredibles, when everyone's super, no one will be. Chaos Knight's crit has been changed too. Chaos Strike is now a passive ability with a 4 second cooldown. When off cooldown, it guarantees you'll crit. It's a 100% chance. The randomness comes specifically with the exact amount of damage you'll crit, from 120% to 250%. 50% lifesteal no matter what, and it works on your illusions. It's kind of odd, don't you think? Isn't this spell taking the chaos out of Chaos Knight? Chen no longer has the ability to amp damage with Penitence, his Q, which seems odd because yet again it's been replaced with an attack speed buff. I feel like this is going to be a trend for every single new ability. It's overall a nerf, the old Penitence buffed magical and pure damage too, but because of a stupid interaction you're buffing the attack speed done to the enemy instead of buffing the ally that then goes ahead to, you know, attack the enemy. Which means that every single unit that attacks that enemy gets the attack speed buff, including wards. 
<laughs> it's <laughs> maybe this isn't so bad after all. Test of Faith though, the once random pure damage nuke plus heal and one time teleporter has now been replaced with Divine Favor, an ally targeted spell with a 12 second duration and 10 second cooldown that boosts HP regen, gives 25% heal amplification and grants up to 80 bonus damage. Oh, and uh, did I say 10 second cooldown? What I meant to say was zero second upon reaching level 15 and getting the talent for it because that's what Test of Faith had and Ice Frog just forgot to really focus on the talents. A constant heal, a constant heal and 80 damage bonus on absolutely every one of your allies, even creeps. It's stupid. Holy Persuasion though has a level requirement, like Enigma's Eidolons. Just because it's literally never been important before this, I'll assume that you don't know the creeps levels and we'll go through them. To be fair, I also didn't and I looked them up for this. At level 1, 2 and 3, you can't Holy Persuade any creep above level 4, 5 and 6. So that bars you from Tomato Man, level 5, Big Bird, level 5, Daddy Centaur, level 5, and the only two level 6 creeps, Sunburn Satyr and the creep that raises the dead and still has his model from Dota 1. I can't remember the official names, but you know exactly who I'm talking about. Basically, this means that you can't immediately dominate a centaur and first blood of fool, but you can get that harpy that shoots lightning, so in reality, it's just as powerful as ever. That's what you do at level 1. If you didn't do that, you were playing wrong. And finally, of course, Holy Persuasion has also been completely remade to act like Keeper of the Light's Recall, which is so strange because Recall works exactly like Recall. I wonder how Coddle will react to someone copying his ability. Clinks, in an effort to make this game more realistic by Ice Frog, has of course had Death Pact removed from the game. I mean, he's a skeleton, how is he supposed to digest things? He doesn't have organs. Makes sense to me that it'd be removed, I mean, of course, it's just such a shame that they forgot to replace it with anything. Now there's just an empty void in his ultimate slot where an ability used to be. Okay, in all seriousness, Burning Army is the new spell, and it spawns six skeletons that share your base damage and use searing arrows. They only attack enemy heroes, can be killed in two hits, and they also suck. They suck so hard. I mean, they'd be really great if they gave Clinks' base damage while letting him keep Death Pact, but without Death Pact, he doesn't really have any damage anyway. Because obviously, you know, that's where he gets his damage. Clinks surely must be getting tired of getting the worst nerfs every single patch, but I guess not. Dark Sears had a couple of little nifty quality of life changes, which is always fun. I, I mean, I keep going on about this. The best updates are the ones that just make things more fun. Wall of Replica being vector targeted, couple of number tweaks, all great, but why we're bothering to talk about him today is because Surge has now no speed limit. Oh boy. This isn't really even a Dark Sears buff as much as it's a Spirit Breaker buff. Surge now doesn't simply just set your movement speed to 550, it actually scales from a plus 36 movement speed increase up to 90%. If you already run at 550 movement speed, as Spirit Breakers are known to do, a 90% movement speed increase can bring you up to 1045 move speed. To put that in perspective, that's nearing speeds higher than the mind can even comprehend. Not as in you can't see them that happens at 30 frames per second but more as in heroes are really small on the screen and moving that fast it's nearly impossible to even click on them this is getting into a really meta sort of sense where it's literally just you can't click on heroes it's not even in the game anymore this is beyond that but still it's a major major buff it's frustrating as hell of course i mean it's going to be fixed of course but right now as we're recording this it's not Spoiler alert for Spirit Breaker, but that guy can deal 55% movement speed as damage with every bash. 55% of 1045 is 575, a bonus 575 magic damage per bash. But wait, we were talking about Dark Set, so let's go back. A neat little trick you can do now with the constant slow upon touching Wall of Replica and the new vector targeting for Wall of Replica is using it lengthwise in choke points so they're constantly being slowed the entire length up. Nifty stuff. Dazzle has lost Weave, which is odd because I'm sure most Dota players didn't even know he had it for how much it was ever used, and has instead gained bad juju. Feels weird saying that. I mean, can we get a is this politically correct test done on that? Thanks. Anyway, uh, bad juju is a passive which immediately makes it better than Weave. You can't forget to use it if it's always on, can you? It's basically just a giant cooldown reduction on everything, including items. Every spell you cast causes all enemy units within a massive AoE to lose 2.5 armor for 8 seconds, stacking and refreshing every time a new spell is cast. And consider that all three of Dazzle's basic abilities have short cooldowns that are made even shorter by bad juju anyway. The fact that this affects items does mean that, uh, M Midas is fantastic on you, and Necro 3 is fantastic on you, and bad juju is fantastic on the Necro units, because bad juju lowers armor and makes them deal more damage, and, and Dazzle is now a position 1 mid carry. For real this time, but don't tell them I told you that. Doom has been clicking on those shady ads that advertise pills on Pornhub because his weapon is increased in length. I don't know about that burning though, that might need to be checked out. Obviously what I'm referring to is his attack range is a little longer even though he's a melee hero. Devour can now also be cast all of the time, which like 
thank god right it was annoying to have a 40 second cooldown spell not work for 80 seconds it also justifies being maxed too by giving you the hp regen that you'd normally level up scorched earth for and for the cherry on top you can devour a creep without losing the last creep's ability if you really wanted to oh finally dragon knight is now completely and utterly better it might seem not to be the case because Elder Dragon's Splash Attack used to deal 100% damage to units in 50 AoE, gradually decreasing to 25% at 250 AoE, but now does 75% damage in a 300 AoE. But riddle me this, when was the last time you actually saw someone closer than 50 units to another hero? It's actually impossible. Even when following someone, you follow at at least 150 units distance behind. Whew. Drow Ranger has had her whole kit yet again tweaked from giving damage to giving attack speed. I don't know why, but it's happening to everyone. Precision Aura now gives attack speed to every ranged unit on your team, which is awful. <laughs> it's so bad. You now can't immediately get a plus 7 damage increase to help out your teammates at level 1. You now can't push a lane by activating Aura and giving your ranged and siege creeps an extra 50 damage, and you can no longer tell your team to stack attack speed items because you'll be covering them in the damage department. This is bad. And to make matters even worse, Marksmanship no longer gives agility, which I remind you is what Precision Aura bases its bonuses off. You get attack speed equal to 68% of your agility, and Drow has terrible agility gain outside of Marksmanship. I mean, she actually has awful stats all around, specifically because Marksmanship covers her in that department. Or did. It's what kept her balanced. But I guess they haha <laughs> lol forgot to take that into account, lol, when they reworked everything. This new Marksmanship provides a 40% chance to land a piercing attack that ignores armor, and also I'm recording this later, but it, it adds damage too. And no, not an extra hit. It's not a 40% chance to land a piercing attack as well as your first attack. It's simply a 40% chance to make your attack ignore armor. <laughs> wow, cool. It does have the ability to insta-kill creeps, I'll give it that. And stacking agility still works even when precision aura gives attack speed depending on agility, because agility on Drowl obviously gives damage and attack speed. She's an agility hero. Anyway, shame about the fact that everything else is terrible. Elder Titan's Astral Spirit is one of the rare, rare abilities that have retained its ability to give bonus damage, and in many ways has become a better spell because of it. Astral Spirit's spell portion deals less impact damage, which sucks, but now it gives plus 80 damage per hero clipped with it, as well as a plus 6 armor and plus 7% movement speed. If we want to talk about stupid strats, the fact that TP scrolls and boots of travel can be used independent of each other means that you can teleport onto one lane, hit a bunch of creeps and heroes with your spirit, TP to the opposite lane with the boots, and position yourself so the spirit zooms through every single hero and lane creep in the game at that moment to have you all of a sudden hit for plus 2,000 damage as soon as the spirit gets back to you. And now all you need to do to keep that up is to do this exact strat every 10 seconds. Yeah, maybe this isn't so good. Ember Spirit's actually bugged right now, so we'll come back to him. Oh wait, no. No, he's not bugged. He's deliberately bad. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Ember Spirit players. And then of course there's Earth Spirit, who is a fascinating hero to watch nobody ever play. This guy has been the only hero to ever always have a stun, a slow, and a silence as his three basic skills. And he's still never picked. This guy's strength gain started at 2.9 when he was added and is now at 3.8. Rolling Boulder is now a 1 second stun on a 4 second cooldown with an extra 1 second being added when using a rock. Boulder Smash is now a giant slow. It's had damage increases. We've got more stone remnant charges. Honestly, everything's pointing towards Earth Spirit being the new greatest hero. In a lot of ways, he already was. Unfortunately for Earth Spirit, not a single soul wants to play him. Can I get an F in chat, please? The F is, of course, for Faces Void, or more appropriately, any poor Sodu gets hit by his Time Lock. Because Time Lock, while still bashing, now makes another Faces Void appear and lands in another attack that also can Time Lock. We'll come back to this. Basically, Time Lock deals a bonus up to 60 damage and causes that 0.75 second mini stun. It used to be 1 second and deal 125 damage, but now it's something much much better. But before I go further, we have to determine if you feel lucky, punk. Because if you do feel lucky, we can do something wacky. We can calculate the odds of time locking once, activating that second hit, and also having that one time lock too. It's a 25% chance for the first thing to happen, so for it to happen twice in succession, it's a 6.25% chance. But that's boring. Let's, let's fucking go for it. Let's calculate the odds of it happening 100 times in a row. <laughs> uh, okay, uh... It's, 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 uh, it's, it, it's, it's hours later. I went down a rabbit hole trying to calculate the odds of a binomial distribution where a result that had a 0.25 chance of recurring successfully occurring a hundred times in a row. I, uh, uh, I, 
Turns out calculating that tends to just brick a lot of calculators. A 25% chance becomes 6.25% chance because the second result depends on the first result being a success, which only has a one quarter chance of happening. After this, about five of these, most calculators start displaying the answer as a sum with a negative exponent. And after about 10, I somehow cause a stack overflow, whatever that may be. At that point, I, I, I tend to just leave well enough alone. Except, of course, as I just said, it took me hours of mind-melting mathematical formulas before I actually got to that point. What I have learned are two things. Number one, the odds of you time-locking 100 times in a row is nearly infinitesimally small, but it is possible. And the second thing I learned, of course, was I shouldn't be a wanker and make stupid jokes about fucking math. Uh, now, fuck all that, next up is Haskar. Uh, <laughs> it's dawning on me that if I don't get all of these done soon, they'll be irreversibly patched out of the game because they're insanely stupid. As of writing this right now, they released 720B and I had to go back and just cut all them silly bits of me praising or crying out in pain over all of the changes. But what I find more disturbing is that in all of those patches, Haskar wasn't mentioned once, which is concerning. Okay, to explain, Haskar's had another one of his trademark, this hero is completely broken, let's specifically tweak his Berserker's blood skill updates. You know the type. You oldies in the Dota community might even remember pre 6.78 way back in early 2013. I was only five years old back then. That's crazy. Back then, Berserker's blood, funnily enough, did pretty much what it does now without any magic resistance. Pre 6.78, Berserker's blood increased attack damage and attack speed for every 7% of his health that was missing. At 14 stacks, he had 168 attack speed and 112 extra damage with no items. Fun days back then. Then it turned into what you all remember, attack speed bonus and magic resistance per stack, but what you might not specifically remember is that for the first few patches back then, you could actually manually cast all attack modifier spells while under Ghost Scepter's active. Surely, I mean, that wouldn't really be too useful, there's very few heroes anyway who have an attack modifier, but one of them was a hero who just had his passive reworked to give him 99% magic resistance when low on health. And again, those were fun days. From 2013 to a couple of days ago, that was what he had, occasionally with a nerf here and there. I mean, which is pretty justifiable actually. And now finally, it's been reworked again, I assume to no avail again, as it's impossible to actually balance Huska. No matter what, he'll be a hero that'll stomp you if you get him as a surprise last pick, but still. 720's Berserker's blood has removed magic resistance. That's pretty much it. Wow! Now it provides HP regen of up to 80% strength based on missing health. Hang on, that just sounds a lot like inner vitality. What happens to inner vitality? Oh, right. And inner vitality has just been straight up removed completely, LOL, and replaced with inner fire. An AoE knockback that deals 265 damage and disarms for 4 seconds for 150 mana on a 12 second cooldown. And can I just say, hooray? This is an insanely powerful skill for Huska. Huska's only struggle in every game is if he's being attacked while not being able to attack. If he's disarmed, if he's stunned, if he's being bashed. And also if he's got Spirit Vessel or any assault on him, but that's still viable. And probably for the best. If that was removed, Haskell wouldn't ever lose. But essentially, in lieu of magic resistance, Berserker's blood has passively gained a constant inner vitality. In lieu of inner vitality, Huska has gained a get out of jail free card. But we've got a few problems now. The magic resistance one we'll skip over right now. It's not actually a problem. It was a deliberate rework that was completely intended to make us all rework our builds. We'll do that in a bit. The problem is twofold. Firstly, inner vitality was controllable. We could both choose to give it to our allies when they needed it, and choose to abstain from using it at all, because it turns out Haskar likes being low. But now we've got a passive that, when he is low, gives him more HP with which to avoid being low. I mean, you can see the Catch-22 situation here, right? If Haskar's own kit is countering him, by not letting him get low exactly when he wants to, Haskar now has to force himself into even more precarious situations of taking an extremely large amount of damage to counteract his regen, whilst also not taking so much damage that he straight up dies. The solution to that previously was to simply just take magic damage. Magic damage couldn't kill you, but could get you low enough to nearly die. That's what made Haskar great. And now it's, <laughs> it's like it's a chore to even make Berserker's blood do what you want. So with that said, here's your new build. Treads, armlet still, I mean obviously, a couple of braces sprinkled in between, and then controversially, no lifesteal, no satanic, straight to heaven's hell bed, and you'll love this, Solar Crest again! Da da da! Okay, we made it, we made it back boys! Solar Crest is back on the menu boys, while not giving evasion anymore, it still reduces 12 armor, gives 10 movement speed, gives 10 to all stats, and slows any person you're attacking by 70 attack speed. In fact, in certain situations you can go this instead of heaven's hell bed, and in those situations we get even wackier, because being a strength hero who depends on health but also magic damage, Haskar can officially and inarguably go Sanj and Kaya. 
He's like the only hero who can. What a what a legend, right? Honestly, if it weren't for the prerequisite experience with him, I'd say that Hasir is the perfect hero to test all of these new 720 items with. Give him Holy Locket, give him both boots, give him all the new status resistance items. Fuck it, give him the new Bloodstone, why not? I mean, no one else is picking it up. Ah, <sighs> now, fuck, there was one hero, dude. <laughs> Series will never end. Okay, for the next few, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna whiz through, right? Bear with me. Io has some changes. Ne oh, Jakira got something. Wow, Juggernaut sucks now. They changed Omni Slash from doing a physical type burst to literally just an attack, which means while he can still proc spells and all that, he's back to being able to miss. Haha, <laughs> good buff, Ice Frog. Keeper of the Light. Oh, okay, this actually calls for a bit of discussion. Ah, <sighs> okay. Colossus is recall, as we know, because obviously Jen has it now. Chakra magic slowly turning into an ultimate skill in terms of power, though. Instead of just your last spell, every basic spell on cooldown gets six seconds removed from that cooldown. There's not a hero that this isn't useful on, but try it with heroes with two second stuns on eight second cooldowns. I mean, do a bit of math to figure out what happens when you do that. Blinding Light's now a non ult ability, whilst, you know, being the exact same spell, even gaining utility in the fact that it now damages. One level out of it is enough to get the static 70% miss chance, but then of course we have the new ultimate. Before we talk a word about all that's new, let's fully establish what's lost. We have lost spirit form, therefore we have lost recall and blinding lights have been moved and all that, but we've lost Coddle's ability to channel illuminate while moving. No more channeling an illuminate, running out and baiting an enemy into it where it'll hit. No more aiming one the way that you are running away from an enemy, running down it and activating it as the enemy chases you down, healing you and killing him. None of that. You, you, you can't do that. And I, and I hate it. I hate it all. Sure, I mean, Scepter allows for the heal still, but so what, right? That's all that we've lost, and I'm, I'm miserable. Let's see what we've gained. Oh. Oh, turns out there's nothing. It's a 120 cooldown AoE repeating stun. For 1.3 seconds, enemies in the circle are stunned, and for 1.75 seconds, they're not. They can use that time to either get out of the circle, or destroy the circle in six hits. <laughs> But the question is, of course, why the fuck would anyone bother to do that? Getting out of the circle is literally easier to do, and destroying the circle doesn't even give gold. It's <laughs> if you do attack the circle, and Coddle uses his blinding light to stop that, he inadvertently just pushes you out of the circle, saving you anyway. What the fuck, right? Unless, of course, you watch Rick and Morty, in which case you'll realize you can actually blinding light outside of the circle to push people in. But still, this is a very stupid spell, and Coddle's now not good. Well, I mean, obviously, I can't say that. Coddle's still got his first three abilities. He's very far from not good, but still, I'm upset, and I need to channel it somewhere. It's either that or the fact that Will of the Wisp isn't even a fucking IO spell. <laughs> Most unrealistic game ever. Alright, back to speedrunning. Legion Commander gets flashy lights to celebrate a duel win. Lich lost sacrifice and instead got a spell that now costs a million mana. Yeah, good job, Ice Frog. Lich can't be played as a support because now he's, you know, mana item dependent. Oh, wait, we didn't play him as a support anyway. I mean, we didn't. Yep, uh, Sinister Gaze has replaced sacrifice, a non damaging fiend's grip, essentially, with the point of it being that it allows for Chain Frost to bounce off of him, but, I mean, this is above two only bad liches. A good lich already just doesn't use Chain Frost when it's sh at shitty time. And the mana cost combined with absolutely no damage makes this spell laughable. Frost Shield's nice, though. It's essentially Ice Armor 2.0. I mean, I mean, dude, they named it Frost Shield. What, did they just check a thesaurus to find two words that mean ice and armor in order to name it this? Well, anyway, it lasts for only six seconds on a 15 second cooldown, but gives 60% physical attack damage reduction. I don't know why it doesn't just say it gives armor. Armor is physical attack damage reduction. Physical spells still do full damage, and pure damage attacks do too. But whatever. I'm sure physical attack damage reduction was also with thesaurus find, and I'll, I'll just let it slide. For those six seconds, you deal 50 damage in a 600 AoE. That's 300 damage. See? I know math. It also slows and can target towers. Essentially, this is a better spell for keeping people locked down through the Chain Frost than the spell deliberately made for it. But in reality, as long as Lich still has that juicy 120 damage talent, I'm very happy. Lifestealer's Feast is amazing, he can dominate tanks with it. I mean, not actually dominate, but you, you know what I mean, you can eat them. Lion now has realistic finger workouts. Every finger of death kill gives plus 50 damage to the rest. So yeah, rush eggs, bro, because all of those count too. And kill steal. Kill steal a lot. Lone Druid's got some nice pleasant changes. We talked about him earlier with the Solar Quest shenanigans. He used to have Rabid, a spell that gave him a tech speed bonus of up to 50, but that was sort of removed because obviously that was too much. And now he has a spell that gives him an attack speed bonus of up to 80. Oh, wait, uh, okay. Ice Frog kind of sucks at removing things, I think. But Spirit Link's cute. For 10 seconds, any damage the bear does gives you life and vice versa. Aw, oh, it's adorable. Build Solar Crest on him. Lycan's had another massive change, which, I mean, really isn't that massive, but again, Hal's been converted from damage bonuses to attack speed bonuses, like every other spell in the game. Wow. Magnus' Shockwave now pulls units towards it and slows, but that's 
pretty much it. Useful for lining people up, you know, for follow-up skewers or reverse polarities, but again, utter legends like me. Well, not, not me specifically, I, I can't play Magnus to save my life, but utter legends like everyone else but me could already make do with landing RPs without this Shockwave. Shockwave just makes it easier, again, for bad players to do the same. And the next reverse polarity I get, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be disappointed in myself because I'll know I didn't actually earn it. Ice Frog's just taking pity on me and giving it for free to stop my suffering. I don't know if I like that. Medusa's had a couple of changes. They all make her more boring. <laughs> Other than the item stuff, which is an indirect change that actually, you know, buffs her, the direct changes that she has kind of suck. Stone Gaze Killing Illusions was a cool ability. It made picking up eggs on Medusa a really fun type of game. And now instead of that, they've replaced it with, oh, look at that, nothing. Nothing. Honestly, why add these changes if they do that? It's one step down from just, you know, having Dota be a board game where you're given a die and told, roll a higher number than the enemy and you win. Sure, it's a perfectly balanced game that's easy to understand and with consistent rules, but there's absolutely no depth. There's absolutely no depth. It's boring, it's embarrassing to play, and they already made that game, it's called Artifact. Meepo's lost his Geo Strike, an incredibly potent passive slow. There's a hard to come by, dude. So, you know, what was it replaced with? Oh, look at that! Again, nothing! Well, nearly nothing. At the time of recording, Meepo has like a 70% win rate, so again, the items around it, specifically Wraith Band, sort of buff him up. But Ransack steals 20 HP on every hit and somehow gives that 20 HP to every Meepo, regardless of range and regardless of the fact that we're not actually stealing 80, we're stealing 20. So how is every Meepo getting 20 as, as well? This universe makes no sense. <laughs> Did you know that? This this video game universe doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Isn't that just wacky? <laughs> it's like punching wood. <laughs> it's like <laughs> getting high on mushrooms and hitting your head on bricks. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Interestingly, this uh, makes attack speed the best thing for me because it's 20 health flat, regardless of your damage. So again, build solar crest on him. Monkey King allows you to stupidly dodge spells using mischief. A spell that you don't need to level up. A spell that you have access to at the start of the game. A spell that a, a, a spell that costs no mana. A spell that was only reduced to have a 20 second cooldown. What the fuck, guys? Why? Ice Frog, what are you doing? Mischief was already a stupidly powerful spell. It still lets you disappear off the map, bypass towers, not draw aggro, and gain movement speed if you turn into a courier. Dumb spell. Puck actually has to spend levels to gain the phase shift ability that Mischief gives innately. Naga Siren's been bombarded with tweaks. In reverse order of relevance, mirror images duration was reduced, the cooldown was reduced, it costs more to cast, and the illusions take less damage. Two buffs, two nerfs. So pretty much just a complete rebalance, just rebalancing in a different place. What really gets Naga discussed in a video that I'm gradually skipping more and more heroes in is specifically because Riptide, her once active E ability, has been changed to a passive attack proc. And it's awesome. Basically what happens is that there's a 17% chance to proc Riptide, but that Riptide, while still reducing armor by the same amount as the old Riptide, only deals 60 damage in the same AoE. It's just, every Naga Siren can proc that. Manta Illusions can proc it, Mirror Image Illusions can proc it. It's entirely possible to just stack agility for the attack speed and send your illusions in to kill a guy strictly through constant Riptide procs. Like, the, your illusions could literally do zero damage and kill a person. Naga Siren is, yet again, an amazing carry, and because Naga <laughs> Siren is yet again an amazing carry, I suggest you yet again absolutely focus your bands around her. Nobody likes to play against Naga. I'm not quite sure that anyone actually likes playing as Naga either. And I'm a little peeved because I can't justify building Meteor Hammer on her anymore. But with that, I think we're nearly done. I mean, technically, it's taken this long to get to the letter N, which marks just over the halfway mark of the alphabet. But I'm... Uh, I'm sure the last letters will just flash by. Next up, Night St... Oh, no. Night Stalker. Day... Uh... Dustmite? Uh, I mean, no offense to the dude, I mean, anyone who maintains two sets of pearly white up and down his face without the invention of modern dentistry deserves praise, but the guy is probably the most bush over person I've ever, I've ever come across. <laughs> dude, at level 1 his base attack damage is 40, and his level 1 void does even less than that on certain heroes. His daytime crippling fear gives a 10% miss chance. <laughs> I'm crippled with fear indeed! Except of course in 720 it doesn't even do that anymore. But of course Night Soka isn't supposed to be the most powerful in the day. He's supposed to stalk the night. So the answer to, is he a good hero in 720 will be the exact same answer for, is he an extremely good hero at night? 
So is he? Well, Crippling Fear has been changed into an aura instead of a single target spell, which is mighty odd, right? No other silence has come from an aura except for arguably disrupt a static storm. The aura is around Night Stalker, so it means that the person or people that you're trying to silence have to be next to you. But obviously if they are, they can be silenced for up to 8 seconds, unable to dispel it with Mantra or Yules, as, as well as obviously their spells. I mean, what do you think a silence does? But at night, Night Stalker can absolutely run toe to toe with any hero to make the aura work, especially with Dark Ascension. Dark Ascension is new ultimate. Instead of simply making it night for 40 more seconds on an 80 second cooldown like Darkness had, it becomes night for 30 seconds with a cooldown of 120 seconds while also transforming you into a horrifying flying demon with 150 bonus damage and 900 unobstructed vision. Weirdly with that, it means that Ags is kind of more useless. Sure, not completely, but Ags gives you 1800 unobstructed flying vision during night for 4200 gold, and Dark Ascension gives you 900 unobstructed flying vision during its duration, which, you know, turns at night for free. But Ags not being needed while also not being changed is a fantastic compliment for this new Night Stalker. Remember ages back when I made that uncomfortably long Ags video, and I had him up in an A tier simply because his Ags was that good? Yeah, lucky I'm not spending my time making hour-long videos like that anymore. <laughs> uh, but if we're not, I mean, if, we, if we're saying that Ags isn't as useful, that means the Dark Ascension must be amazing. And it, it really kind of is. But I mean, who even cares about Nightstalker anymore, right? Who even cares about any hero thus far? This series of breakdowns could honestly have just been called The Road to Ogre Magi, because Ogre Magi can multicast with items now. Let me repeat. <gasps> Ogun Magi can multicast with items now. And what I read, when I read that, is Ogun Magi can now multicast with Midas. And yes, it absolutely works. This is a thing that is officially in the game as a feature. Remember, this, is, this has been recorded in 720B, which means that they had the ability to patch it out, and they didn't. Any item that is cast on an enemy unit can be multicasted, including, but not limited to, Medallion, Four Staff, Dagon, Yules, Atos, Orchid, Nullifier, Scythe, Earthblade, Deathblade, and Heaven's Helmet. And of course, obviously, Hand of Midas, which the Dota Wiki states will only proc on creeps. Like, um, like, thanks, Dota Wiki, because we all, for some reason, assumed otherwise, even though it's always been like that. But okay, okay, right. Let's talk seriously about this, right? All of the other items being able to be multicasted is totally neat, but most items are items that we might have already gotten anyway. Midas is the outlier, the item that fundamentally flips the build, so let's just work out if it's actually for the better. Ogre Magi isn't the most item-dependent hero, so he can kind of justify boots into Midas Rush, but let's assume that you get Arcanes and finish Midas at 20 minutes. That's good for a support, right? Of which Ogre Magi, I guess, used to be. At minutes 20 to 25, it's possible to hit level 12 and that second level of multicast, so let's be generous and say that we did. We have, on this first cast, the ability to triple our earnings and XP, a feat that would normally take 4.5 minutes. Wow. Okay, let me put that into perspective, right? A single three times cast boots your GPM for that specific minute to at least 691, not including other creeps we'd already have farmed. Failing that, but getting a two times multicast works fine too. Honestly, you only need one multicast with Midas to justify the Midas at all, and that Midas goes directly into farming the XP with which to get the level three multicast even faster, which would give you the opportunity to four times multicast, which would give you even more gold and XP. Or if you're living in 3018, a scythe advice for four sheep to start your own wool industry. Moving on, Omni Knight's lost Repel, which might be good? I don't know, it was the only ability in the game that could give a hero a BKB, but making it more exclusive makes BKB itself more powerful, right? Anyway, it's replaced with um, Heavenly Grace, that's a nice name. What a nice spell. Uh, uh, okay, let's read. It, it applies a strong dispel to an allied unit, oh that's neat, and increases status resistance to- oh yeah, no, I hate this ability. Next! Oh hey Oracle, you're still in this game. Good for you! Outworld Devourer now splashes arcane orb damage onto units in 175 range of the targets. But holy shit, 175 is not as big as you think it is. Even though, I mean, it, it finally works on Ancients, which is always a pretty good plus. The giant elephant in the room is of course the fact that Essence Aura has been replaced with Equilibrium, a spell that lasts for 7 seconds with a cooldown of 18 and restores 140% of damage you deal as mana, as well as slowing enemies who are hit by any spell damage during that time by 32% for 1.75 seconds. Except. Every time they take spell based damage, it's refreshed. If you attack faster than 1.75 seconds, it's permanent. And <laughs> it works for items. Let's ignore that for now. Basically, the conundrum is thus 
Arcane Orb still does less damage the lower mana you have, which would call for you to maintain high mana, right? But Equilibrium is a spell that you cast to gain mana. Logically, you wouldn't be needing mana if you were already close to full, and the only way to stay full for Arcane Orb to do its job is to constantly be regenning mana with Essence Aura, or in 720 Equilibrium, a spell that lasts for 7 seconds with a cooldown of 18. This is an entirely anti-synergistic synergy. Nearly, right? OD in this state, right now, building him the exact same way is bad. It will lose your game. You'd be forgiven for taking this information and converting the message to OD in 720 is bad, because that's not exactly what we're saying. We can't say that yet. All we can conclude is playing him the same way, he's much, much worse than he was. So let's play him in a different way. But before that, a few tips. Equilibrium gives you mana based off of damage for 7 seconds. Both Orb and Astral have delays before they damage. One is a few milliseconds, obviously, because of the travel time of the Orb, but the other is 4 seconds. So cast Equilibrium after you've cast both of them. Cast Equilibrium while that Orb is in the air. Cast Equilibrium as they're about to come out of Astral. And farm Ancients. It's awesome. Okay, so the build. Firstly, max Astral Imprisonment with a value point in Equilibrium and Arcane Orb. Only one level of Arcane Orb. It's specifically for the ability to slow with an attack and also Orb Walk and, you know, get last hits with that extra little bit of damage. Don't use it for that too much because, I mean, you're gonna run out of mana in this system. Obviously, with only one level in Q, the damage isn't max, but neither is the mana cost. Then, alternate between E and Q, constantly making sure you have exactly 250 mana, never going under that. This is the exact amount of mana to cast Astral and Equilibrium in succession. Doing so on a wave will give you about 800 mana. This is pretty good. Ironically, the hero touted by Ice Frog is the int hero who never has to worry about his mana, has now absolutely got to worry about his mana. Well, maybe not worry, maybe just more keep an eye on it. Believe me, this is nothing but a buff in the long run. We just have to work for it. Playing right will net us victories. And with all of this said and our skill build set to let us safely farm on lane, what exactly are we farming for? Okay, you are with me, right? You are in agreement that OD is nearly impossible to play worse considering that he has a 35% win rate at the time of writing this, right? Right? That means that any idea that we're chucking out right now has some credence to it because it, it, it could potentially be better than a 35% win rate, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna go Radiance. Now hold on, hold on, hear me out because Obviously I'm, obviously, I'm kidding, right? It'd be silly. While yes, Radiance Damage does turn Equilibrium into a giant 700 AoE mana sapping, movement slowing, damage dealing cacophony with no added mana cost on an 18 second cooldown. Wait, was I supposed to be listing bad things? Huh. I can't actually think of any. Okay, obviously I'm being a little facetious. I don't want people's ideas of me to turn into what I actually am. Radiance is inarguably awesome on OD, but don't rush it. In all seriousness, you could legitimately go at late game if Shiva's guard just doesn't cut it for you. What I would actually suggest is Yasha and Kaya. Into Bloodstone, into Octarine, and then into Radiance. We'll talk more about Bloodstone another time, but for now, its new active plus equilibrium means that you can gain health without losing mana. But Yasha and Kaya is actually awesome on OD. Movement speed, attack speed, spell lamp, and the mana cost and mana loss reduction. KY is yours and mine. Lube up and get in there. Uh. Pangolies lost his most boring spell and had it replaced with an also boring spell. Oh. Basically it's just a passive that has a 20% chance to slow and either silence or disarm. Problem is there's absolutely no way to do one or the other and there are very very few instances where you want to try and silence someone to then go Ah, well, I didn't silence, but this disarm did the job anyway. I'll get back to you on this change in depth later. Just before we head off, because you attack so fast and they stack, it's possible to proc a silence and a disarm, which is always fun. But moving on, Phantom Assassin has had a f fun patch. You know how fun it is to play against PA? <laughs> Remember how fun it is? It's good fun. It's great fun. There's not a single soul in existence who just doesn't twiddle their diddle at the mere thought of being offered the privilege of playing with a phantom assassin on the other team. <sighs> well, don't you worry, folks, because <laughs> with PA's reworked abilities, it'll be even more fun to be mercilessly beaten down from. Because Phantom Strike has been given a shorter cooldown, shorter cast time, gives more attack speed, has no attack counter limit, and no longer disappears upon attacking a new unit. So essentially, what this is, is a 2.5 second max speed giver, as well as a blink. If you didn't have 1000 GPM as 720 PA with an ability that gives both 
the ability to jump from creep camp to creep camp faster, as well as killing creeps faster, I'd find that very, very hard to believe. <laughs> but obviously moving on to the next hero, Psyche! PA's still not! <laughs> She's also been given an active component to her blur, which, you know, also still retains the passive evasion. Now, for 25 seconds on a 45 second cooldown, you can literally just disappear completely, unable to be targeted, unable to be seen, that's not dispelled by attacking. You can farm creeps with this, you can sneak past wards with this, you can literally touch spells with this, because you essentially disappear, right? And all spells that are disjointed by going invisible will work here too, because for some reason there's a 0.75 linger time after the spell is broken, and the spell is broken when in 600 range of a hero or a tower. So obviously using it right next to a hero would put it on cooldown immediately and just, you know, break the ability. But no, the linger time means that in the middle of a team fight, while you're next to an enemy, you can cast blur and disappear for a deliberate 0.75 seconds. You can dodge Laguna Blade with it. Jesus Christ, poor puck, am I right? Everybody's just, everybody is just stealing his shtick. Speaking of puck, phase shift has now been removed and given out to other heroes, leaving puck with a literal void where that spell used to be. <laughs> okay, not quite. That's not exactly true officially. It's pretty much what happened, but they didn't write it down. What they did write down is that Dream Coil applies that new leash, which means it's impossible to force stuff or blink out of it. This is actually kind of huge. This is really groundbreaking stuff. Normally, the idea with Puck was that you could counter Dream Coil not by dodging the snap stun, but instead simply having the stun happen in your preferred place and on your own terms. What I mean by that is you'd blink into trees so you'd be able to wait out the stun in a safe place because you'd be in the trees as the snap breaks, right? You absolutely cannot do that now. You either have to snap the stun by walking out, or you can do what I like to call the merry-go-round strat, where you run from Puck, but in a clockwise fashion to avoid the snap damage. Or you could do what I do in actual games and do both. Running around for 5.9 seconds, tanking Puck's auto attacks, but at least not taking any damage from Dream Coil, and then right at the end, right at the end, because I can't count, I blink out, take 500 damage, get stunned for three more seconds, and end up not dying because the Puck player feels so ashamed of me that he just ups and leaves. I, uh, I get to go back to base, but with all the stairs that I get on the walk back, I, I, I would have rather he just killed me. Pudge's Flesh Heap no longer gives magic resistance, meaning the poor guy actually takes the same amount of rot damage as his target. Maybe more, actually, if that hero has a spell or item that actually gives him magic resistance. But it does give Pudge 12 HP regen. Hmm, only 12, eh? And we're lacking in magic resistance, eh? <laughs> well, I'm stumped. I do not know what to go to amp up Flesh Heap's measly 12 HP regen, while also simultaneously giving Pudge some form of supplemental magic resistance. If only there was a new item added in 720 that did just that and more. And oh, would you look at that, Holy Locket has just appeared on screen as if from the ether. Or maybe it did. I, I don't know. These are fucking long videos, dude. Maybe I've forgotten to add it in the edit. Or maybe I'm just doing a bit and I never intended on adding it on screen for a laugh. You never know with me. I intend to live my entire life making people think that my utter incompetence is actually all just a very, very deliberate joke. A joke on who? I don't know. But I can probably guess. Huh. <sighs> But with all that said, the final push begins now. 32 heroes remain. Let's hope I make it before my limbs fall off in protest. <sighs> Alright. Hit me with that Guile theme and we'll power on through this all. Quop's quite quaint, quantifying a quixotic quality of questionable buffs, which is to say, cool, she has a knockback whoopty fucking do. Razor sucks, his unstable current is pretty awful and probably on accident too. The way his passive movement speed buff works on unstable concurrent is that it's just giving him a percentage increase to his base movement speed, rather than giving an increase on his actual movement speed, including items and agility and all that shit. He's also completely lost his slow and purge, while also gaining the ability to, you know, ruin his last hits for himself. Don't level up E in the laning phase. I'd say that Razor sucks, but not actually because of the update, he sucked earlier too. Rubik is... Well, thankfully not much has really happened with Rubik. Considering I'm right about to talk at length about Rubik in another video series, let's be brief here. Better stats, more strength, more agility, more end, and Null Field has become a new spell entirely. A few patches ago, it was a passive magic resistance for your team, and then it was a toggleable spell that either gave magic resistance or negative magic resistance if it was set to affect enemies. So in reality, it wasn't really a toggleable spell. It was a spell that gave negative magic resistance to enemies that you sometimes misclicked on and caused it to accidentally give you magic resistance. You 
you never use the ladder deliberately. Technically, it was the same ability, number-wise, but man, people really prefer spells that kill enemies way more than spells that save themselves. Huh, I don't really know what to do with that information. But now officially it just gives only spell amp and causes negative status resistance. You know how I feel about status resistance and you know how I feel about negative status resistance. So let's move on. Rubik has kind of played mid nearly entirely now which uh, kind of makes an oldie like me who really got good at Dota around TI2 times very very happy. I think even people who started playing Dota around TI7 would have had their friends at least recommend to watch Na'Vi's run in TI2 right with Dendi, Rubik mid in nearly every single one of those games. I mean, I mean, shit, dude, like, those big plays of magical, the play came from TI2. I mean, that story is one of the most gripping in esports history. The reasons back then for Rubik Med and the reasons now for Rubik Med are kind of different, but there's a bunch of reasons in 720, but one of them is that Arcane Supremacy amps all of your stuff, which means that Telekinesis, which doesn't do any damage, doesn't actually need to be leveled up anymore. It's actually more beneficial to level up Arcane Supremacy if you want more stun duration. And because you're doing that, and because Rubik's had an increase on all of his attributes and attribute gain, he's a really strong mid. Because all of a sudden to get the negative status resistance, you're accidentally and incidentally getting the exact spell that gives you more spell amp, right? So now all of a sudden you've got Fade Bolt. If you're up against a mid who has just one amazing spell or stun, or something like that, and you hit level 6 before them, then you've pretty much won. Fade Bolt lowers enemy attack damage, Arcane Supremacy makes that even longer, but yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves, we'll talk about that later. Sand King's do 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 is now this awesome AoE ability, and I love every single part of this. <laughs> I don't even play Sand King, and I don't really have that many memorable memories playing against him, or playing as him, but this is just fun. It, it, it's like this 650 AoE arena that Sand King definitely is in, but now you don't know what exactly he's doing in it. He could be attacking someone, he could be casting spells, he could be reading the paper! This, this is fun! Shadow Demon's got a really fascinating change that I think I really like. You know why I like it? Because it reminds me of a spell Skeleton King had. Remember Skeleton King? I like Skeleton King. I miss Skeleton King. You bastards, you. You. Bastards. Let your ironic jokes get in the way of a sincerely awesome ability. All because it was a fucking active. Ah uh ha, -huh, uh -huh, oh ha ha ha, an active on Skeleton King, whatever will we do? He's now impossible to play. Please Valve, please revert this, ah oh, ha 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 And you know what? They fucking did. And then they took Skeleton King and buried him under the floorboards. Mortal Strike used to, for a time, take 20% health from a person, giving it back exactly after 7 seconds. I mean, technically this spell did no damage, but in practice, using this at the right time could kill any hero, and with its spiritual successor now being on a hero that, you know, plays around one massive burst of damage, I think I love it yet again. Now just don't fuck it up guys, get 5 stacks of shadow poison, and right before you activate them, hit the enemy with a soul catcher, can't regen health when you're dead! Shadow Shaman on the other hand is kind of being dumbed down. I mean, I mean, is that fair to say? Basically what Shadow Shaman could do last patch is the exact same as what he does in this patch. Specifically I'm referring to Mass Serpent Ward traps. Shadow Shaman has been given two changes in this patch and literally both of them are only to make trapping someone in Serpent Wards easier. But again, easier for who? easier for people who could already do it? If they could already do it, then this changes nothing. So naturally, that would leave people who couldn't do it before, or what we occasionally refer to as bad players. For the umpteenth time in 720, a hero has been made easier to play whilst removing some of that hero's charm and skill ceiling. Make of that what you will. Slada has been... I don't actually know if you know this or not. In fact, I assume that you don't, because for some reason, a mass of people who don't know you and who you will never meet have told you that you really shouldn't play it, but League of Legends has abilities extremely like what Slada has just been given. I don't know why you've never played League of Legends. It, 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 it is a MOBA that's really close to Dota, another game that you really like. The idea that you'd hate Lee because you like Dota is extremely oxymoronical. I mean, to be fair, I've also never played League of Legends either, but I also don't like Dota, so I mean that checks out, right? Anyway, basically instead of a proc chance, Slada is given a guaranteed bash on your fourth hit of an enemy. Not on your fourth hit in general, you can't hit a creep three times and then guarantee a first hit bash on a hero right after, but uh, you know, every four hits a 1.3 second bash. And now the immediate question is, so how much do I need to stun lock someone because we are evil people? So without judgement on you disgusting 
fucking freaks. I did the calculations. With exactly 522 attack speed, at level 25, Slada can perma bash his opponent. He can go under 522, maybe to around 490, maybe 480, if the hero doesn't have an item or instant cast spell that saves them. But actually, there are no items that could really actually, you know, save you. Hellbird, sure, but with the passive evasion, you'd already be safe anyway. Abyssal, um, or, or maybe. Ghost Scepter? I've never even heard of that item in my life. It's irrelevant in an actual game though, because I mean obviously you've also got an 8 second cooldown, 2 second stun as well. And hurrah, another hero that FaZe genuinely makes sense on. So what, that's like 2 now? And now Slot. Do we really have to talk about him? Basically he's that hero that was annoying last patch, horrifying 2 patches ago, frightening 3 patches ago, and is now an absolute nightmare right now. I mean it's the same thing every patch, he's just somewhere unprecedented on the spectrum of frustration. He jumps around all the time, sometimes he goes backwards, sometimes he goes forwards, but he's never off the spectrum of frustration. Slark is clearly one of the winners of Dota 720 in terms of item and general changes, as well as a winner in terms of the heroes that were also buffed and nerfed around him. It's weird that there are three different categories that broadly define any hero success in every single patch. The items of that patch, the heroes of that patch, and then funnily Lastly, in terms of importance, the actual changes he himself got. They're not really as important as everything else, but we'll touch on them really quick just to say that we did. Uh, Pounce obviously applies Leash now, which is more of a general change rather than a Slark specific change, but basically it just means that it's the exact same as Puck's Dream Coil having Leash from earlier. Slark was countered by Anti-Mages and Morphlings and all of those edgy carries that could just elude the guy, but nope, not anymore. I don't know why they gave it to Slag, but not anymore. There is a nifty way to cheat your way out of it, however, although I can't really guarantee that you'll ever see it, you know, done in a pro game. Basically, put yourself on the very edge of the leash and plant an iron branch tree right on you while not phase and will push you out. And then you crack one liner as you escape. Something like, haha, I gotta run, two's great, but tree's a crowd. <laughs> or, I hope you're not stumped. This part is mandatory, by the way. Failing to make a one-liner will result in your immediate IRL death. So it's a very high risk, high reward play, you know? D I mean, Dota's getting pretty serious these days. Imagine actually seeing that in a pro game at a LAN, just someone actually dying. Then obviously Shadow Dance lasting longer is good, Hex being purgeable again being good with Dark Pact, and, and of course finally the completion of the trifactor of attribute stealing. While Silencer and Pudge steal int and strength, Slark can finally permanently steal one agility from anyone who's affected by the Essence Shift debuff. Let me remind you that that buff lasts 120 seconds. And this isn't even mentioning the fact that 5 Wraith Bands on Slark is considered a below average amount, and all of the other heroes in the game that are being played right now are also being countered by Slark. Speaking of which, Storm Spirit's a unique hero to be talking about when talking about the buffs and nerfs of 720 because the name Storm Spirit never appears a single time in any of the web pages or patch notes. But Storm wasn't exempt from 720 just because he was never mentioned. Sure, he, I mean, he wasn't tweaked directly, but everything in 720 seems to be indirectly wanting to crush him. The leash debuff is a given, of course, but so is the rework to Treads and Phase. Storm Spirit loved the int and attack speed of the old treads, but with the new boots he can only get one or the other, with wasted stats filling the rest of that item for him. He doesn't really care about armor, and he doesn't really care about just having 10 damage. Sure, damage is great and all that, but his damage comes from Overload. Overload is a spell that is kind of better with attack speed. Storm Spirit's also a very, very slow hero. One of the slowest in the games, and with the percent based movement speed changes, him going a very normal and respectable treads into Yules would only give him 42.75 movement speed from the treads, and then 17 movement speed from the Yules. And 719, they would have given 50 and then 30, I think. We've lost like 20 movement speed just incidentally from 80 to 60. And then, of course, the mana regeneration formula rework, the bloodstone rework. God, man, it's it's really seeming like Storm Spirit players have gotten the absolute scraps in this update. Lucky I'm not a Storm Spirit player! <laughs> Sniper's take aim is misleading and dumb. With Hurricane Pike, the level 25 talent, and four levels of take aim, you have an attack range of 1,215. It says in the description that it would double it, but double that would be 2,430. What you actually get is 1,615 range, because what it's essentially doing is just doubling the fucking take aim. So you lied to me, Ice Frog. You lied to me. Huh. 
<laughs> I don't even care. Honestly, like, at that point, the range is so fucking far that you're not even on the same screen as the person that you're attacking. At that point, you don't even know where you are in relation to the other person. At that point, you're honestly just firing into another person's game. And that's, you know, I mean, at that point, you're a literal stream sniper. Well, you already kind of touched on Spirit Break with the Darkseer bit. Uh, Spirit Break is awesome. Play him with DS and enjoy the one-hit bashes. Uh, Sven has been given one of the most horrifying abilities with his new HP shield. Horrifying in a good way. I mean, if you're playing him. Horrifying in a bad way if you're anyone who isn't. Basically, it's this and Flame Guard that do it, and both are extremely powerful for what they purport to do. Okay, so bear with me. So Sven's Warcry gives a 10 second buff that gives movement speed and essentially 400 extra health to tank physical attacks. The non-magic brother of Pipe of Insight, pretty much. The movement speed buff is lost as the shield is consumed. Now, let me explain why this is terrifying. Flame Guard and Warcry, whilst doing the opposite in terms of protection against a type of damage, both counter the exact same amount of damage types. Okay, so that's a very odd thing for me to say, right? So let me explain. Both have two components, a shield from a specific damage type and a buff that's given from that shield until that shield has tanked too much of that damage type and is dissipated. That means that both spells are good against magic and physical. To remove Flame Guard, you need to deal magic damage. Dealing magic damage causes Ember to take no damage. Dealing physical damage causes Flame Guard to not be removed, right? To remove Warcry, you need to deal physical damage. Dealing physical damage causes Sven to take no damage. Both spells have a bonus while up, both spells need to be removed, and both spells tank the exact damage type that you need to remove them. They're frightening spells, especially considering Warcry is an AoE spell, even though it only lasts for 10 seconds. So basically what I'm saying is that the spells are your new best friend. Oh look at that! Oracle has a few of them. Hi Oracle! Techies is a hero so buffed and so reworked that Ice Frog and all of his minions have got to want to just pull the big red switch and just remove him from the game. I mean, they're honestly nearing the end of the rope, clearly. Since he's been added, he's been reworked like 50 times and he's been made a very, very slow hero. This will balance him, is the assumption, I assume, but with years of that absolutely not working, Ice Frog's just like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe Buffer's movement speed, maybe that'll fix him. I don't know why that was my Ice Frog voice, I'm so sorry that you heard that. But honestly, after being slowed and slowed and slowed, all of a sudden, in one patch, he's been giving buffs to movement speed. I don't know what this does, maybe this will fix him, somehow it might fix him. I, like, literally, it, it could. With the movement speed buff, it encourages a different type of play, because obviously now you've got the blast off and all that. And so, maybe just by giving him a buff, it stops him from doing the things that were bad from before. I I don't know, it's a very odd type of rework that I don't think was even intended, but legitimately could fix techies. But then again, <laughs> why waste the time? Just fucking get rid of him. Get rid of him, Ice Frog. You can do it. You have the ability. Listen to me, please. But obviously, I mean, I'm kidding. Ice Frog wouldn't remove a bad hero. He wouldn't do that. He'd only just remove everybody's favorite skeleton. Terra Blade Sunder no longer goes through BKB. The Sunder five seconds later, though, <laughs> might. TB is still OP. Terra Blade has been <laughs> crushing all through the last updates. I mean, ever since TI8 and in 720B, the, the the big patch that was supposed to change everything, this is it. That's the change. I mean, maybe legitimately it'll work because the meta just shifts around and sort of prioritizes heroes that beat Terra Blade. I mean, shit, Slark's been buffed a major way, and Slark is a really good hero against Terra Blade. Ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, this compilation is already two hours, but I have so much I just, I just, I want to say about Tidehunter. Anchor Smash doesn't do physical spell damage anymore. It literally just procs an attack in an AoE around you. Build Maelstrom, build Crit. My god, dude. Yes, build Echo Saber. Echo Saber is yet again amazing on Tidehunter, which I am only saying because I am obligated to say it, even though secretly I knew it was never not bad on Tidehunter. It's just... I'm not allowed to make those crazy statements as much anymore because it makes me look like I'm crazy. You can proc the Echo Saber slow on all heroes hit by Anchor Smash without Echo Saber even going on cooldown. I'm so fucking thankful that T is near the end of the alphabet because this little clearly broken tidbit is hidden away for only the coolest of kids to stumble upon. Tidehunter Echo Saber, I wish I could say more. I don't really have much to say about Tibbasaur in this patch, but I, I did want to point out the fact that there was a rebalance in the health regeneration formula that basically gave everybody m more health than regen. Except they forgot to do that with Tibbasaur's reactive armor passive. I, so, he's 
worse. He's worse for wear. I will point out something that I do kind of like. It's just funny. Whirling Death now gives extra damage per tree cut down, but only by 22 each. The old one did the same, kinda. It changed the damage from magic to pure if you hit a tree, but you only needed to hit one tree for it to do that and basically deal the max damage that it could. Now that Whirling Death is always pure, but overall deals less damage, you've got to go out of your way to destroy more trees. And this is what I find funny, because Timbersaw is a dirty, dirty hypocrite. Sure, he talks a big game about destroying every tree he comes across, but deep down secretly he depends on them. He cannot live without them. Literally, his, his spells depend on having a tree be there. And you wouldn't know the exact pain that I'm talking about unless you have been that Timbersaw, playing a game where you realize that last team fight in this exact area that you're fighting in now, I mean, back then you just weren't conservative with your tree felling, and now as you limp away on one HP, you realize that there's no more trees to timber chain away to. They're gaining on you. You're not a fast hero. You need to be able to timber chain away. But the last team fight that you, <laughs> that you had here, you just wiped out the entire forest. I just thought that was interesting. Whirling Death asks for more trees to be chopped down, but are there enough trees to go around for that? Hmm, question for the philosophers. But ignoring all of that that was said before, Troll Warlord is a hero that you probably skipped forward to get to. But screw you, just cause, I mean, you missed out on an awesome segment for another hero that I won't tell you about because screw you. But yes, of course, Troll Warlord's been given a crazy rework that's very publicly known in the sense that he does more damage, gains more fervor stacks, and snares rather than bashes, and therefore can now buy basher, an item that Troll Warlord is frighteningly able to use pretty well. But what you want me to talk about is the fact that Battle Trance causes you to essentially lose complete control of your hero for 6.5 seconds, gaining attack speed, movement speed, lifesteal, and an end insatiable hunger for blood <sighs> but the uh, the problem there is what you're gonna do with the attack speed when you're a hero that has an excess of attack speed but what am I even talking about you are unkillable for 6.5 seconds in which you can lifestyle 80% of your damage and basically get back to full health the only problem is <laughs> you can just be disarmed Whoops, forgot about that one, didn't you, Ice Frog? Something fascinating about Troll in 720 is that there are a couple of changes to items and other heroes, and more specifically, the lack of a change in one item, Orb of Venom. Orb of Venom can, like it always could, be in your inventory when you throw a ranged axe attack at an enemy, be in your inventory when you throw a ranged axe attack at an enemy, and then do the melee version of the slow, 12% as opposed to 4% for the ranged, if you're in melee form when the attack lands. If you can imagine that. This combined with new jungles and the new item reworks and this new meta kind of. Uh, I mean, it kind of makes Troll an amazing support. Believe me, dude, I'm as shocked as you are, but honestly, his ultimate is really bad on a position 1 carry on account of its absolute unpredictability and counterplay potential. But Battle Trance could, in reality, be referred to more as like a defensive get out of jail free card. And that is something that a farm independent item independent, aura and warding support hero would absolutely love a lot. Dude, give it a try, honestly. Play with understanding friends, of course, that's a given for doing something as stupid as this, and be a ranged harassing safe lane support that has a melee version of the Orb of Venom slow. I honestly don't think this will be the last time I ever talk about this. I need to run some experiments. We'll get back to you. Tusk has now been given an ability called Tag Team, which is... In, an interesting name. It replaced Frozen Sigil. And let me just say, like really seriously, I feel really bad for the Tusk Workshop set creators who just slaved away for months and months making an awesome Tusk set for the Frostivist event because half of that work would have gone into a model for a unit that literally can't even appear in a Dota game ever again. And it's an event called Frostivist, dude. Five billion people would have been working on a Tusk set for an event about the cold. Undying has had his flesh golem completely reworked, which is probably for the best on account of nobody actually, you know, knowing what it did. Just in case you were madly curious about it, it um, used to amp damage and slow enemies depending on how close Undying was to them. It was a nearly completely unnoticeable effect, unless you were going out of your way to look for it, except of course for the big fuck off giant zombie with guts and gore pouring out of him. What it now does is cast a 40% slow in a much smaller 375 AoE, enemy units in 400 AoE, which is, for some reason, not 375 AoE, constantly lose 7% of their current health, current health, as magic damage per second, and you gain 1,600 health on cast. Whew. What's awesome about this is that it's essentially just a buff to your actual ultimate spell, which is Tombstone. 
Tombstone zombies perk up and get all of their bonuses when the enemy gets below 35% health. And the thing is, Flesh Golem helps with exactly that. It doesn't kill, it doesn't deal much damage to low HP heroes, but it does deal percentage based damage. You can counter high HP heroes, you can counter low total HP heroes too. You counter everything, especially when you pick up an eggs. The only problem with that is, ha ha ha, lol, imagine successfully farming an eggs on undying, lol. I like the change though, I mean, not enough to play him or anything, that'd be <laughs> ludicrous. But I'm sure there's one person out there who's quietly watching this and going, yes! Ursus pretty much lost a major part of his kid. Poor guy. He's no longer a counter to evasion. And I'm not even sad. Bye, Ursa! Vengeful Spirit's Ags upgrade is kind of shitty again. Vengeance Aura by itself, with just one level of it, spawns an illusion upon your death. The only thing that Ags does is let you cast abilities, namely a one second stun, a fucking mediocre armor reduction, and the swap. But generally, if you've died in a fight, your team's probably not gonna be, you know, in need of armor reduction. They're more in need of a god to come down and save them from the eternal damnation about to be wrought upon them because they're clearly losing the fight. Generally, I used the Vengeance Aura to farm and pull and stack while I was dead. But it wasn't because I wanted to. <laughs> as soon as that ability was added, my carries demanded that I go in. Even in death, I can't fucking escape my support duties. Can you imagine a worse torture? The only thing worse is putting in 26 hour days to get this video done in time, even though <laughs> it's probably going to be patched out in a couple of seconds after I upload. <laughs> but that pain is nearly over. Only a few more heroes left, so let's go. Venomancer has, okay, oh okay, a um, couple of talent tweaks. Okay, that's neat. Uh, Viper, okay, uh, Viper's pretty much just got the same, a bit of rescaling. Oh, oh, uh, Warlock has, a oh, oh wait, no, that's just a bit of a tweak on his spells coding. Um, oh, aha, Weaver, my old pal Weaver, my wacky Weaver. I can always depend on him to have some zany, oh. Oh, no, uh, his swarm units now just have a higher attack priority. Um, well, that's neat. Creeps will attack them over you. That's uh, that's good for diving, maybe. <clears throat> okay, Witch Doctor increase, uh, Wraith King, Skeleton Reincarnation, the first time they die. Uh, okay, and um, Zeus uh, gets, a, get, gets a coding hotfix. Okay, um, well, that's it. Bit of an anticlimactic ending. All right, bye. Yes, I'm painfully aware that I'm a little late on all of this. I know. Uh, by the time that I'm recording this right now, it's 720D, and by the time that it finishes uploading, who knows? It could be 720G. I think I'd bring it upon myself, you know. I was the one who decided, hey, you know what? You haven't made a two-hour video before. You should do that! Well, no, that's not exactly how it went down. The two-hour thing was more just incidental than planned from the start. Honestly, I was hoping to have the only way to play 720B. At most, 20-minute video that briefly touches upon the most important of patch notes, but I tend to write in a really hedonistic way, where instead of writing from top to bottom, I skip ahead, read my favorite patch notes, write my thoughts on all of them, and then edit them down to something more concise and less insane, and then go back and fill in the rest. I wrote about OD and Huskar and a few others and realized, oh, I've hit an hour and I've hit about 10,000 words. Well then, by the time I recorded all of my preliminary thoughts in preparation for the editing down stage of the videos, I discovered that the recording was about three hours long. I think you can catch in the final edit the sections that I record first and the sections that I recorded last, based purely off of the joviality in my voice. I was so pure and energetic at the start, and by the last sentence I was wheezing those syllables out. In this little outro, of course, I sound fine, but it's because right now I'm recording it a day and a bit after the video, on account of the Patreon peeps getting early access to the video before, you know, you guys do. So I had a chance to rest my poor little larynx. Anyway, the audio got edited down to one hour and 50 something, which pissed me right off because it's not quite two hours. I don't know why hitting two hours seems so important to me, but for some reason I really want to. It's not like YouTube is trying to pad their content to hit 10 minutes so they can, you know, shotgun blast a bunch of adverts randomly spread through their uploads. It's not like at exactly two hours I gain access to the ability to have my videos contain super ads that appear every other second. It was just a personal milestone that I couldn't reach simply by leaving in audio or really dumb and retrospect theorycrafting ideas. I'm not going to subject you to stuff like that just to make my videos longer. Which, yes, um, means that I actually cut a lot of dumb theorycrafting ideas from my recordings. Which might make you think back to the bit where the OD Radiant stuff wasn't cut. Which means that I'm super serious about all of that, dude. 
Anyway, I'm not trying to pad this video out to two hours subtly by going on and on in the intro, so let's just wrap it all up. This video absolutely positively would not have been possible without the support of my awesome pledges, Patreon people who pledge actual money to see these insane videos come out. I don't know why they do it, but hey, don't question a good thing, right? The names of all my Patreon pledges are scrolling up on the screen to the right, or to my left, I guess. But I'd like to thank, by name, the following people. Chris 1996, Foxy of Fucking Luxley, Michael Rob, Miles Lou, Mind Siege Towers, Asbestos, Kim Nelson, Lincoln, Mow the Lawn or I'll drop an engine on your for three for, for 38? I think it's supposed to be feet. My name is Kelkor Bushimi and I've been unranked since 2016. Good on you. Shadow Sweetheart, Squirting McFloaty, Tefetu, Apache Mari wearing a headwear neckwear nicknamed Tatcrafter, Carbon Bond, Chan Diggity Dog, Christian Rudder, Dan Cleric, Fusion, Huh! Grumman. Hey, that's pretty good. It's Coop de Grace, for fuck's sake. Jolly Jew Giant, Jonathan Scary, Keegan Mayer, King Gizzard and the Shitty Wizard, Tsunami Shadow, Michael Shepard, Mylocon, Mini Shoof, Much Skill Very Pro Well, Neutral Platonic Land Based Vertebrate, Orange Filter Sky, Paul Moran, Peyton Dean, Procrastination Studios, Pro S, Poonith P, Raphael Silver, Rhett Mitchell, Rick Flareon, Woo! RJ shouldn't have to play Position 5 every game, Ryugu Mufle, Shiva's God, Spencer Davis, Sterile Isle Cheryl, Taco God Boomdog, Thomas Johnston, Uncommon Alias, Wazer 107, Yabos McGee, and yeah, anime. <laughs> and now because I'm tantalizingly close to making it to two hours, I'm just gonna have a black screen for the next few minutes. Feel free to go to your next video. There's not really gonna be anything at the end of this. It's purely just black, just to get to two hours. Honestly, I, I, I'm telling the truth. There's nothing.